Okay, so this will be quite possibly our 12th or 13th get together. And please go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 and the goal is going to be to attempt, if time allows, to look at every prophecy in the four Gospels and you'd be surprised how many there are. I must admit that as of the day before yesterday, I have arrived up until the 12th chapter of John. I haven't quite finished this project, so we'll see how it goes. I know when we met in the West Country last year, we profiled, no, it was this year, wasn't it? It was Judas in the spring of this year, excuse me. We did a four and a half hour study looking at Judas Iscariot, treachery and all that stuff. And that was almost completed, but not quite. I think it ran to around 75%. So let's see how we get on. We are three days, four days in the Northwest of London. And I have no idea how time will run, but 19, Revelation chapter 19. Let's get this study underway. Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 10, if you will. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So never once would the Lord Jesus Christ refuse worship. And it's always worth reminding ourselves of this wonderful fact. If you speak to uh, Jews or Muslims, they will bend over backwards to say, well, Jesus was a prophet. Of course, the Muslims will give them that. The Jews won't. Some of the Jews will say, well, we accept him as a Jewish character, but we don't go beyond that. But they don't like the idea of anybody worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. Fell at his feet to worship him. This is John speaking. Said unto me, see thou do it not, which is similar to what Cornelius would hear from the mouth of Simon Peter from the book of Acts. And yet, if you go to Rome, the good and the great line up to meet the Pope, to kiss his ring, to bow down to him. And one of my recent videos looked at the elites in America, especially and a few Brits, but mainly Americans that visit the Vatican on a regular basis. And they dress up and they well, pretty much worship the man, to be quite honest. You've got feminists, you've got man-haters, you've got pro-abortionists, you've got pro-homosexuals, you've got uh, people being married and divorced multiple times. What would they have in common with the church which condemns that? Well, quite a lot, it would appear. The whole thing is a farce. See thou do it not, and yet the Pope will take the worship, and other religious people will. I am thy fellow servant. And this is very interesting, because it would appear in heaven that those that are angelic or those that become angelic like and of course John is speaking here or when the saved die and arrive in heaven are angelic in a sense the Lord says in heaven they're neither married nor given a marriage but are like the angels so you've got the, the possibility of John speaking to Daniel Daniel speaking to John it's hard to really fathom it I know but Daniel says to John because this is the context I am thy fellow servant. Of course, Daniel was a Jew. John was a Jew. So you get an idea as to what it's going to be like in glory. I am thy fellow servant. In other words, I was just like you, a fellow servant. And of thy brethren, fellow Jew, that had the testimony of Jesus. I was commissioned to preach and proclaim. And of course, Daniel is one of the greatest books in the Old Testament. Worship God for the testimony, the witness of Jesus is a spirit, the anointing of prophecy. So in other words, everything that you want to know about the Lord or future or past events will be found solely in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's quite a statement to make. So keep that in mind and go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I think if we can spend the next three mornings uh, looking at these verses, we should hopefully uh, get a good blessing and a good understanding of the mind of the Lord. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse uh, 19, if you will. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation and yet the church of rome is the biggest private interpreter 
when it comes to the scriptures. They give the scriptures and the scripture course, spoken in the singular, a lot of lip service. They say, well, we wrote the Bible. They say we decided what was in the Bible. We decided it at the Council of Carthage, which of course is completely incorrect. Uh, when the Council of Carthage met, just for the record, they simply reaffirmed what we already knew, that the New Testament was 27 books, Old Testament 39 books. So we don't need to have a council tell us three or four hundred years later what the Bible actually is. We know what it is. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So I guess it's like, if you will, asking an architect to build a property for you or designing it and giving the, the blueprints to the builders to build. Or if you ask somebody to perhaps build a computer for you, you say, I want this, I want that, I want uh, specific software, so on and so forth. I can't build it myself, but I know what I want. And then the builder comes along with his or her tools and they start to build it for you. The point Peter is made, making here is that the prophets, Old Testament, which is the context here, didn't just get together, have a powwow and say, let's create a new religion. Let's put our thoughts onto paper. And I'm always mindful, mindful of Matthew 28, when the Lord has just appeared to the 11, and it says, how some believed not. Now, you wouldn't put that in Scripture if you're trying to start up a new religion. You'd say, we all believed, we all were on the same page, we were all filled with power and passion and drive and enthusiasm. So for Matthew to say that, from Matthew 28, shows the honesty. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Very similar to John chapter 1 concerning the new birth, like the new birth doesn't come through the will of man or through the will of flesh or through this person or that person. The new birth, meaning the source of salvation, comes strictly and solely via the Saviour. So one more time, 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Christ, of course, is the light of the world, until the day dawn and the star arise in your hearts. Partly picturing the second advent, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So it's scripture with scripture. Martin Luther would say, you read the scripture with the scripture. The scripture interprets itself. If you take the time to read it and study it, and of course, if you're born again, until you're born again, this book isn't for you. For the prophecy, Old Testament, feeding into the New Testament, for the prophecy, prophets leading up to the prophet of prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the prophecy came not in old time, Old Testament, by the will of men. Like I say, this wasn't off their own backs. This was due to the Lord's uh, will, his sovereign will, of course. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we're not holy in and of ourselves. We know that. Go to Luke chapter 10. We are declared holy for the New Testament once we are born again. For the Old Testament, you've got prophets, always men, incidentally, that were anointed, were given, given a blessing, and like I say, they would write what the Lord told them to write. So there's no margin for error. There's no margin for error whatsoever. And let's give the scripture the benefit of the doubt, and let's say this, that the writers of the New Testament knew what they were talking about. They were saved religious Jews. Let's also remind ourselves of one thing, that when the Lord came and he chose himself the 12 and the 70, that gives you 82 people, they weren't religious people. You've got a tax collector, pretty much content, counting his own money, despised by his own people. You've got a group of low middle class fishermen. Jewish, of course, perhaps went to the temple as and when they wanted to, but they weren't devout religious Jews. If you think about that account from the later parts of Matthew 26, 27 or thereabouts, make it 26, 27. Peter is cursing and cussing, he's blaspheming, he's upset that the, he's been spotted. And people say, hey, we know you, you're from Galilee, we can recognize your speech. And the guy starts to really cuss, he starts to really swear and blaspheme. And that uh, biblical truth is a nightmare for holiness people, because they say, well, if you still cuss, if you still swear, if you still lose your temper, you're not saved. So I suppose Peter wasn't saved, was he? I mean, the guy was a, a fisherman, and fishermen, like uh, building constructors, are pretty rough and ready. I mean, I remember some years ago working at a particular place, and we had a guy who came from Argentina, and he was involved with one of the people at my place of employment at the time. He was living with her, and to cut a long story short, 
he went down to London and he went on a building site and he was gone for six or seven weeks. And he came back to where we all were and he was cussing, he was cursing, he was blaspheming. And I remember one occasion I was on the phone speaking to somebody and one of the directors wasn't far away from me. And this guy was sitting opposite me, as near as we are, and he was speaking to somebody else in our proximity, and he was really cussing and cursing. And one of the directors said, watch your mouth, you know, you can't speak that way in here. He had been contaminated, to see. He'd gone down to London, he'd worked with East London people, working class people, and those guys can really cuss. I mean, those guys can really, you know, make your hair stand on end. I mean, if you wanted to listen to those people, not that you would, but if you did, or... If you think of the Roman soldiers back in the day of Simon Peter, if they heard Peter cussing, they would be making notes. I mean, he was really pouring, he was really pouring out of his mouth. You know, I don't know that blankety blank carpenter from Nazareth. I don't know him. Starts to blaspheme, picturing the old nature. Luke chapter 10, Luke uh, chapter 10, look at 24, if you will. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Well, this is remarkable. This goes back to our study, like I say, from the spring in Scotland, looking at Judas and his treachery, and that guy saw pretty much everything. In fact, not only did he see everything, not only did he hear everything, he was casting out devils. He was doing miracles. People sometimes overlook that. I mean, he had the anointing. He'd go into somebody's home and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. he said, say, you are free. You are set free. And then turn around and start perhaps gossiping. Turn and start saying, is that really the Messiah? Yeah. Can we really trust him? Tell you the truth, the Lord never lied once, that many, not some, that many prophets and kings, Old Testament, have desired to see those things which ye see. Even the Old Testament prophets didn't get to the entire picture. They never saw the church age. They never saw the rapture. They saw the first coming and the second coming. And to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So eyes to see, ears to hear. And we say, need to know basis. So these verses lay the framework, the foundation for this, well, potentially pretty long study. We'll see how time allows, how time goes. But again, the Lord is speaking to the apostles. He's got the 10 in mind and the 70 from verse 1. They're going to go out. They're going to do signs and wonders. They're going to be anointed in a way that Old Testament greats were never anointed. This partly goes into the book of Acts, but by the middle part of Acts, it's all gone. It's all blown out. People aren't being healed and set free like they once were. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Let's keep moving on. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So Matthew is referred, is referred to as Levi or Levi. And Matthew was a Levite. He was from the line of priests, but he was far from being a priest. When the Lord found him, he was a tax collector. He was a despised man. He was one of the wealthiest people probably in Israel. And one day he was doing his work and the Messiah walked past him. A crowd followed him. People were being healed. And even Matthew, the old hardened cynic, thought this is something special. And he knew some Old Testament scripture. He knew that one day the Messiah would come. He knew one day people would be set free and that Israel would be delivered. Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 18, please. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was a spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately or privily. Based on the Old Testament, of course, it would have been uh, in his mind and he would have been aware of Deuteronomy 24 and he would have been mindful of the fact that they're not technically married, although they are married, they're engaged, but not yet physically come together. But while he thought on these things, behold... The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So, one more time, and I said this over the years, I'll say it again very briefly, that the angel of the Lord can fluctuate in the Old Testament. It can be Jesus Christ, a Christophany for the New Testament. It can be the Holy Spirit. And here, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, third member of the Trinity, is reassuring Joseph that the baby, the babe in Mary's womb, is from the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Keep your hand there, and go to First Samuel chapter 2. He shall save his people from their sins. He shall save first and foremost Israel from their sins. 
then he will save the church, those that believe on him, from their sins. And I mean all of their past, present, and future sins. First Samuel uh, chapter 2, First Samuel chapter 2, uh, look at verse 25, if you will. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. So we are Bible believers. We hold to substitutionary atonement. Most churches don't understand that. N.T. Wright, the Anglican bishop, very well thought of in America. He is an apostate, of course. N.T. Wright, while well, speaking on Premier Radio, maybe two or three years ago, maybe less actually, and he was saying the idea of substitutionary atonement just fills me with horror and dread. The idea of, of a man being whipped and beaten to death, somehow dying in our place, is horrendous to me, abhorrent. So therefore, once you reject, as N.T. Wright has, the substitutionary atonement, how do you save yourself? I mean, what can you offer the Lord? This is the problem that Muslims have, and the Jews. They never know if they're saved because they won't know they're saved. They can't know they're saved. The heart condemns them all, all of the time. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him concerning human terms. But if a man or woman sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Who will intercede for him? This is a good question. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. So this goes back to apostate jury, uh, the sons of Samuel. Uh, or Eli, excuse me. Samuel, of course, is found in verse 26. Look at verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. So he's a type of Christ. And this is picked up from Luke chapter 1. Go back to Matthew chapter 1, please. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 22, if you will. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So it's been said by dispensationalists over the years that the term or the name Emmanuel has uh, a future application for the thousand year reign of Christ, because you won't find anybody in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, calling Jesus Emmanuel. In fact, keep your hand there and go to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah is the main book that is cited in the four Gospels. The four writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were literal men. Uh, when they quote the Old Testament, quote and lean heavily on Isaiah. And it's no surprise that modern scholarship like to say that Isaiah was written by three people. And again, undermine people's faith in the scripture. I mean, if I was a devil, I'd be doing exactly what these people are doing. We've done Speaker's Corner twice. You've been with us, I think, once. And those Muslims know what they're talking about. And they start to quote uh, Christian leaders, apostates, which most Christians haven't heard of. But those guys have heard of them. And they, they quote people like N.T. Wright, which we've already discussed, and other well-known people. And they say, well, such and such said that three people wrote Isaiah. Or they go to the Q theory, that Matthew went first and Mark copied Matthew. And then Luke came along and copied the pair of you know, both their writings. And they question John because 80% of what is found in John is only found in John. And if you are a typical Christian, you've got no way to push back on this. Uh, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7, look at verse 14, please. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin meaning just that. And you'd be surprised how many people have bent over backwards to overthrow the word virgin to be a young woman a maid, and if that was the case, big deal. Women fall pregnant every day. Who'd care about a young Jewish woman engaged to perhaps a slightly older Jewish gentleman becoming pregnant? Nobody would care about that. But if she was a virgin, it's a big deal. Lord himself, triune God, shall give you a sign. The Jews are entitled to a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. So it's a double application in the, in the context. It's dealing with Isaiah, of course, and his wife and child from memory. But behind that, you've got the Messiah and Mary. And also this goes back to the reality that Jesus Christ wasn't able to sin. You'd be surprised how many people think that Christ could have chosen to sin. 
I mean, conservative people, I don't think that's. Yes, he was tempted. Yes, he was tested. Yes, he was tied. Yes, he was hungry. Yes, he was short-tempered. Yes, he was this. Yes, he was that. But I can't find anywhere where he ever sinned. Go back to Matthew chapter 1, please. Matthew chapter 1. Look at uh, 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And you are not till she brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus, meaning Jehovah saves. Now, allow me to do a slight detour. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it now. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Around two years ago, a brother in Scotland very kindly sent me a small book concerning a debate that took place in the Brethren Assembly, maybe 150 years ago, concerning the eternal sonship of Christ. And I've never really thought about this, not in great depth. It's a typical... 19th century book. It's hard to read. Those guys wrote in a particular way back in the day. I think we've lost a lot of education over the last hundred years, a lot of writing skills, and I have to read it very carefully. And I'll be honest with you, it was a bit of a chore to work through it. It's a bit like Dickens. Hard to read, old English. But I did finish it. You know, I always say if I start something, I want to finish it. And this goes back to a discussion, a debate somewhere in the assembly circles. It could be in America. I think it was in Britain, actually about whether or not Jesus Christ is eternal. Is the Son eternal or is the Word eternal? And I read the book, and I remember when I first got saved, coming across Walter Martin's website. He's long dead, of course. And Walter Martin, I don't agree with everything that he taught and preached, but he has some good points, would be asked about the eternal Sonship of Christ. What do you make of it, Dr. Martin? They would ask him. And he would say, well, the eternal Sonship of Christ is a Catholic doctrine. And he wouldn't go beyond that. So I thought, well, for this morning, and the next couple of mornings, if time allows us, and if we are all wanting to, let's do a slight detour and see if we can get into the scripture to see whether or not Jesus Christ as the Son is eternal, or Jesus Christ as the Word was eternal. And I can think of many fights going on right now on YouTube. Some of my friends are fighting right now on YouTube over this very subject. Maybe I'll get some heat when people hear my thoughts on this. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse 6, please. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So as far as I am concerned, it all starts primarily here. Yes, you've got... Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, from Proverbs chapter 2, repeated over in Acts chapter 13. But the teaching, the announcement concerning a child, a son, for me, starts really here. For unto us, children of Israel, a child is born, could be the son of man. Unto us, a son is given, son of God. And the government, the authority, the weight of the world shall be upon his shoulder. He'll carry this all alone. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Name singular. This is reminiscent to Matthew 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. For unto us, the children of Israel, a child is born, son of man. Unto us, the church, those that believe on him, a son is given. Son of God, because God Almighty is his father. He had no human father. And that's one of the reasons why they were saved from John 8, that he was born of fornication. Where in reality, they were born of fornication. Because if you believe the Schofield note, which I read a couple, of days, a couple of days ago, very interesting. He said one of the reasons why the Jews rejected Jesus was because they were Ishmaelites. They were following Ishmael over, what, five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten generations or so. You've got Jews marrying Jews, of course intermingling, a lot of inbreeding going on, and therefore they're not technically Abrahamicites, if that's the correct term to use, they are Ishmaelites. I thought it was an interesting statement. Governments, authority shall be upon his shoulder, and his name singular shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gabor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Another heresy today, uh, goes along the lines of Jesus Christ, they say, is God the Father. Have you heard that one? It's doing the rounds all over YouTube. Jesus Christ is God the Father. No, he's not. But they believe that. 
They believe that. So I'm going to say this, that here, this is dealing with the incarnation. This is dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ being born or about to be born in time. And also this prophecy was given, what, 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's dealing with the word becoming flesh, deity becoming flesh and dwelling among, uh, dwelling among us. One more time and I move on. For unto us, the children of Israel, a child is born, son of man. Unto us a son is given, son of God, two parts. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, singular, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. Of course, the Holy Ghost is referred to as the Comforter. Very similar term, Counselor, Comforter, but they're not the same person. The Mighty God, not God the Father. This is, de this is dealing with Israel. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. My peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Go to uh, Romans chapter 14, please. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Uh, Romans chapter 14. Look at verse uh, 16, please. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we could say this from Isaiah chapter 9. It's dealing with... The first coming, the second coming, son of man, son, son of God. You've got the government found over in Isaiah dealing with the thousand year reign leading into eternity. But for today, dealing with the kingdom of God. So for today, the Lord Jesus Christ has his kingdom in a spiritual sense. He would say to Pilate, my kingdom is not yet of this world. And every post-millennialist overlooks that and takes the word yet out and teaches my kingdom is not of this world and they get away with the thousand year reign. No, it says my kingdom is not is not yet of this world. For the kingdom of God, for now it's spiritual, but one day it will be physical, is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Go to Psalm 49. Uh, Psalm 49. I was reading this late last night uh, just to see if we could touch on this this morning. I thought, yep. It does seem to go quite nicely. As you all know, the Bible is a circular book. Uh, you never really get it down. It's like a 3D document, if that makes sense. You, you feel you've got it down. And I've been looking at this book, reading it for 16 years. Still don't really understand it. Psalm 49, Psalm 49. Uh, look at verse 10, please. For he saith that wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Absolutely. People like Anarsis, Getty, and Murdoch. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Absolutely, they do. People like uh, the Kennedys, uh, Churchill, and no doubt other people, uh, well-to-do characters, Trump Tower, for example. Verse 12. Nevertheless, man being in honour abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their saying. Selah. So the reason why I took you to Psalm 49 after looking at Romans 14 is because in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not physical, it's spiritual. As Bible believers, we have no physical head. As Bible believers, we have the scripture and the saviour. As Bible believers, we are looking for New Jerusalem. We are looking for the thousand-year reign of Christ, the rapture, of course, if that's uh, going to happen in our lifetime. We don't know, but if it is, praise the Lord. We're not looking for something physical. And yet from uh, Psalm 49, 10, 11, 12 and 13, it's very much dealing with physical things because physical things corrupt. Uh, and once something corrupts, it's worthless. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, look at verse 1 please. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. Never happened for Muhammad, never happened for the Dalai Lama. Never happened for you, you or me, or anybody that I can think of from antiquity. This is also going to lead up to the second coming. Isaiah speaks about kings bringing gifts to the Messiah, who is stationed on his holy hill, and I mean Jerusalem, not Rome. 
And we could use these verses to say that Christmas, quote unquote, or the exchanging of gifts for Christmas is permitted, providing you're born again, and you want to bring gifts, or you want to worship the Lord, you want to thank him for what he's done. I don't see a major problem with that, but don't bother with the trees, the tinsel, Father Christmas, all that rubbish. Three, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, I bet he was. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He gets all of the Jesuits together, all the Dominicans, all the Franciscans, all the good old Anglicans, all the Charismatics, all the Calvinists, all the Arminians, all the good and the great, the great brains of today, and yet you say to those guys, how can I be saved? I got 30 seconds to live. Give me the gospel. They can't do it. Try it sometime. These guys will write seven, eight hundred page books, nine hundred page books about when was Jesus Christ begotten. And yet you say, I'm dying. I've had a heart attack. I'm on the floor. An ambulance is being called for. I've got 20 seconds to live. How can I be saved? They can't tell you. N.T. Wright says, the blood of Christ. Ooh, stay away from it, he says. Substitution of atonement. It makes me shudder. So I guess he's trusting in his baptism, is he? But Paul would say, I wasn't sent to baptize. I was sent to preach the gospel. Five. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, and thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. A governor. A governor. Go to Micah chapter 5. A governor. A governor, a ruler, a ruler, a governor, are they the same? Not really. You've got religious people very uh, fearful of losing their positions in this country, and it's probably the same in America, and possibly Spain, and maybe Singapore. Churches have charitable status. Not just churches, mosques, synagogues, and it's something which these people are very keen to get and abuse. And Patrick can tell you some awful stories when he was a Catholic, how it was abused in our old church. Priests would have cars on the parish, holidays, three months in America, three months in Canada, uh, all in the parish, nice tiling on the walls. Yeah. Was it five pounds a tile? Yeah. Eight pounds a tile? Pounds a tile yeah. Not bad, eight pounds a tile for the priests. Yeah. Same in these Protestant churches and these people, these so-called religious people live like kings and queens. And yes, some are queens. <laughs> But uh, they're very careful what they say in this country. That's why you won't find preachers and preacheresses calling out sin. They wouldn't dare. Same is true in America. So you've got a king. You've got Herod. This is Herod the first, incidentally. Herod the Great. Though he wasn't great. He was awful. Calling in all of his wise men. And he says, we've got three guys who just breezed in with an army of around 2,000 soldiers. They're going around Jerusalem saying, where is the king of the Jews? It could be two o'clock in the morning, who knows? It probably was actually, the way the Lord works with these people. Everyone's awake, what's going on? And he calls the good and the great, gets them out of bed. And he says, where is this king to be born? And they say, well, your honor, he's going to be born in Mecca. No, they don't say that. Or he's going to be born in Barcelona. No, they don't say that. He's going to be born in Singapore. No, they don't say that. They get it right, but they pick the words very carefully. In Bethlehem of Judea, city of David, not Rome, not Colorado, not London. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and now they quote it, but not quite. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least, the smallest, among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Micah chapter 5. And look at verse 2, if you will. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. They've changed one word from ruler to governor, because to say to Herod, he's going to be a ruler, means he's coming for your job. He's coming for Pilate's job. He's coming to replace the Sanhedrin. So they won't say that, they say, no, no, he's going to be a governor. A governor is not a ruler. A ruler isn't, strictly speaking, a governor. And the last part they completely miss out. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This guy's eternal. This guy didn't just turn up one day like Joseph Smith or Harry Krishna. 
this guy is from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, that the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. In the context, first advent, in the context, second advent. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. So you've got these wise men all around King Herod's throne. And they have to be very careful what they say. Priests in the Church of Rome are political. They have seven years training. Out of their seven years training, they spend around three or four years looking at church history, economics, uh, democracy, uh, diplomacy, uh, and other aspects of society, which isn't really their remit. They are so-called priests, but of course not priests. They are politicians. They're not like what we would do. I mean, we're going to be here for three or four days. We're going to hit the streets later. We're going to get the banner up. We're going to talk to people. We're here for a purpose. We're not here for our own health, but they won't do that. So therefore, they are giving half of the truth. And we discussed this over breakfast this morning. A lot of people are omitting facts, which is the same as lying. You don't tell people the whole story. You hold back. And as a result, you are lying. Let's be quite honest. And they are lying because they know that to go beyond it, beyond it is going to be problematic. And therefore, they say, for out of thee shall come a governor, not a ruler. That's your rule. My people Israel. And verse 7, then Herod. When he had privily, privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He wants further information about this account. He knows that this crowd that have arrived are, for the most part, Gentiles. They've come from a long distance and they are coming to seek and to search out the Saviour. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, look at verse 11, if you will, please. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So three parts to, or three gifts to present to the master, because he's a priest, he's a prophet, he is a king. And again, going back to Revelation chapter 19, never once does the Lord refuse worship. You can't worship him enough, you can't praise him enough, you can't thank him enough, and yet many times we don't even do the basics. We fail him in that area. Thankfully, our salvation doesn't depend on our service, but it's still shameful. If you look at the Muslims, they have their prayer services in parts of the Middle East, and it's a big deal. The entire town hears the old prayer to call. I think of the Palestinian leaders over the years, uh, people like Abbas and Arafat, and they go on television in the Palestinian uh, territories, and uh, they can't praise their God enough. Allah this, Allah that, Allah Akbar. And yet you watch Israeli leaders on television, very well polished, educated in Britain or America. They've been to the top universities. Occasionally they'll mention the Lord, but not very often. It's even worse in the UK. But of course in America they play the religion game. Americans expect to hear God bless America. They'd be shocked if they didn't hear it. And most Americans are still religious. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. Uh, but from our standpoint, we should worship the Lord much more than we do. Look at verse 12, please. And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. This goes back to the Old Testament. So on one occasion when David was up against it, he had Saul hot on his heels, and he said to the Lord, is he going to come for me? And the Lord said, yes, he's going to come for you, David. And he says, what about if I do this? Or what about if I do that? And the Lord said, that's okay. If you do this or if you do that, it's all going to be fine. Now, for a Calvinist, that's a difficult piece of scripture to deal with because in the mind of the Calvinist, everything has been preordained. Everything before the world even began. So you can't really amend the will of the Lord. This is what the Calvinist has, would, you know, would have you believe. But for David, he was able to avoid a situation. Now, for the Lord Jesus Christ, he would say to the apostles, and I'm paraphrasing now, he would, say, he would say this, that if you go to a particular town and it gets a bit hairy, go somewhere else. If you go here or go there and they kick against it, dust off your shoes and go somewhere else. In other words, don't become a punch bag. You know, there's many more places to go to. And as we continue to work uh, in London over the next few days, we will probably go to different places and you know, it will be more productive than others. But here, word has got back to people such as the wise men and also... Joseph and Mary, that there's a war going on, there's a spiritual war going on, and therefore verse 13 makes sense. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, 
and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So obviously Egypt is a type of the world system, and we are currently working through the book of Exodus, and you've got the people of Israel in Egypt for a good 400 plus years, and that's the worst type of place for God's people to be. I guess for us as saved people, it's bad enough working, living, uh, existing amongst unsaved people. But imagine being in that position for decade after decade, or in the case of the Jews, centuries after centuries. It'd be absolutely appalling. And you would think to yourself, this is ever going to end. I'm sure people that went through the death camps thought the same thing. We've been here two, three, four years. We've seen three or four Christmases. We've seen Easter's come and go. We've seen such and such a family uh, disappear. We've seen people kill themselves. In fact, I've got one quick statistic that I want to share, slight deviation. And it's always worth going back to how things used to be to compare to how things are today. One of the concerns that I do have, and I've spoken about this many times over the last couple of years, is the growth of the transgender movement. It's a situation which isn't really going to go away. And apparently, 41% of transgender people will commit suicide. The figure remains the same, even after they have surgery and hormonal replacement. So even after they have their parts removed, and I'm trying not to be too crude here, but I mean, even after they go through the operations, it still doesn't help them. They're still in an awful state. But get this, the death rate, the suicide rate amongst the transgender community is higher than it was during World War II, during the death camps. Now, if you think about six, seven, maybe eight million, or let's just say two, three million people went through the death camps. It's probably much more than that, but just, just, just give it a round figure. Let's say 10 million people went through the death camps. I've been conservative. According to my figures, more transgender people commit suicide than those that went through the death camps. And you say, why? Because what they are doing is abnormal. They kill themselves, not because of what people think about them or what people say about them, but what they think about themselves. They can't live with themselves. And they have their parts removed, so on and so forth, and they're still unhappy. They're still grieved. Angel of the Lord, verse 13, for the Old Testament, many times, but not always, but many times, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, New Testament, it's the Holy Ghost, would appear to Joseph in a dream, many dreams in Matthew's Gospel, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Always note that the child is mentioned before the mother. There's no worship of Mary in the New Testament. There's never been any worship of Mary in the New Testament. It comes later through tradition, that wicked term. Flee into Egypt. Now, normally, God's people come out of Egypt. But here, they're going into Egypt for a period of sanctuary, a period of safety. Until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So go back to the Old Testament. The Jews are saved. They are delivered from Egypt. They come out of Egypt. They go into the promised land. And they remain there for, well, right up until 70 AD. Even after 70 AD, there's still a strong remnant to some extent that stayed in Israel. If you think about Nebuchadnezzar when he arrived in uh, Jerusalem, he would take the kings and their nobles off to Babylon. One king would have his eyes removed. But people like Jeremiah and others were able to remain behind. And they were shown grace by the Lord. So we can say this, that the Jews have always, have always been in Israel. Pre-Nebuchadnezzar, post-Nebuchadnezzar, pre-Titus, post-Titus. But officially they go back in 1948 because that's what the Lord wants. And because one day, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And of course, when he returns, he's going to be ruling, ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. <laughs> When he arose, verse 14, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there unto the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Go to Hosea. So for the Old Testament, the term uh, son of God or uh, sons of God nearly always refers to um, angels, those from the angelic world. There's one exception uh, from Luke chapter 3 where Adam is referred to as the Son of God. Going back to Adam 
was created. Jesus Christ was begotten. Hosea chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11. Look at verse 1, please. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So Israel is referred to as God's son or God's firstborn. King David is referred to as the firstborn of God, not in the sense of when he was born, but in the sense of his standing, his preeminence in the sight of the Lord. Israel as a nation is referred to as God's firstborn. Israel here is referred to as God's child, God's son. But for Matthew uh, chapter 2, the context isn't dealing with Israel as a nation, it's dealing with the Messiah who is a son of Israel, a descendant from Israel. So therefore, you've got the Jews coming out of Egypt, like I say, going to the promised land. You've got the Son of God, mother, stepfather going into Egypt for a period of sanctuary until things die down. With the death of King Herod the Great, he wasn't great, as I've already said, his son Archelaus would replace him. And of course, Archelaus uh, would be just as wicked, just as deplorable until the Lord would deal with him later on. Matthew chapter 2, go back to Matthew chapter 2, uh, Matthew chapter 2, look at verse 16 please. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. That of course is genocide, and people... Occasionally I like to throw the Bible in our faces and say, your God is an awful God, a bloody God. And they say some pretty heavy things about the Lord. And here you've got Herod wiping out, well, you can, only not, you can only guess how many children and going after others. But don't allow unsaved people to let you. Back in 1970, there was an event that took place in Syria called Black September. You may remember it. And in 1970, the king of Syria, King Hassad, excuse me, President Hassad, let me just correct myself, President Assad, this current leader's father, decided to deal with the Palestinian problem. Now, I wasn't born in 1970, but I'm a interested party in history, and I remember these types of events because they are pretty uh, gruesome. An old Assad, old style hardliner decided to murder 20,000 Palestinians. Now if Israel had done that, had Britain or America done that, or let's take it down to 200 people, there'd be people in the streets of London, New York, Los Angeles, Barcelona, who knows where else, people be absolutely screaming bloody murder as they say. But Assad did it and not a word was said because you've got a Muslim killing Muslims. They don't care about that. But when Jews deal with Muslims in a self-defense sense, it's a different ball game. So you got Herod back in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, a wicked despot, an antichrist, a puppet leader, if you will, working for Rome, a bit like those that were working for the Nazis during World War II. He decides to eliminate uh, any child, any male child that would be born in Bethlehem under the age of two years of age, and that would have been major news. Now, if you speak to Jewish people, if you think of somebody such as Josephus, Josephus will say this, he will say, well, we can't find any record of this in our documents, and therefore it didn't happen. But that's not the whole story. Never forget that when the temple went down in 70 AD, Israel lost a lot of their materials documents, names of rabbis, family, lineages, so on and so forth. On top of that, would this want to be made public? It'd be embarrassing to the leaders in Rome that Herod was killing children. So we shouldn't be overly surprised if this isn't found in secular writings. But that's not to say that it didn't happen. Of course it did happen, because here we are reading about it in the Gospel of Matthew. Look at 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Go to Jeremiah 31. Now it gets a little bit tricky, because Jeremiah 
picks up this uh, account, or I should probably say Matthew quotes it from Jeremiah, and of course Jeremiah is uh, speaking about such an event. And of course, if it's Rachel, going back to uh, the first five books of the Bible, then you've got a gap because she's long dead. Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, look at verse 15, please. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, or Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. So Rachel, or Raquel, pronounced differently by different people, is now representing the suffering woman of Israel. For Revelation, you've got the woman and the man-child, Revelation chapter 12, and some people say it's Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Others say it is Israel. Well, of course, Mary, again, is, like the Lord Jesus Christ, a daughter of Israel. And yes, there are types of Mary back in the Old Testament, Sarah is a type of Mary. Uh, Rachel, Rebecca, and we discussed one of those earlier today, is a type of Mary. Uh, the mother of Samuel, and we looked at him also this morning, is a type of Mary. So here Jeremiah, writing long after her death, of course, is using her as a type of suffering Israel. 16. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. So the statement is very clear that, although it was pretty bleak during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ having to leave Israel, and it was pretty bleak when all those boys were slaughtered, and it's been pretty bleak for the last 2,000 years or so, they will come again to their own border, verse 17. So therefore, 1945, 1946, with the end of World War II, you've got millions of Jews, not just in Europe, but in America, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, deciding to go back into Israel. Solidarity. A lot of guilt as well. A lot of wealthy Jews got out of Germany. They saw what was going on, and they had money to get out of Germany and they saw what was going on and they thought to themselves we've failed our own people we've seen millions go through the camps we've seen many rounded up sent here sent there we were living comfortably in parts of America and of course many were and we were safe in Britain and many were and we were safe in here or safe in Canada safe in Australia wherever and therefore many decided to go back into Israel in 1948 to show solidarity and of course they will stay there uh, from 48 to the return of the Lord. Look at verse 18, please. I've surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastened me, and I was chastened as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. So Ephraim, also Rachel, has been uh, cited as being somebody that we should be aware of. But these verses, once again, point back to the Lord dealing with his own people, dealing with Israel historically, covenantly, and prophetically. And like I say, the main book that is going to be cited from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Isaiah. Jeremiah does get quoted, and of course Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. The Lord Jesus Christ was an emotional man, I think we can say that. And therefore it's very interesting when we bounce back and forth. I go back to uh, Matthew chapter 2. I can say that Matthew's gospel just dominates the New Testament, when it comes to prophecies. You've got miracles in Matthew, you've got dreams in Matthew, you've got prophecies in Matthew. Mark doesn't come anywhere near. Luke doesn't come anywhere near. John doesn't really come anywhere near. But if you want to know about miracles, dreams, and prophecy, start with Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. Look at verse 19, if you will. But when Herod was dead... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding 
being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And most liberal theologians, most ex-Christians, most atheists, most people in the higher criticism world will say, well, I can't find this in the Old Testament. Where does it say in the Old Testament that he would be called a Nazarene or he'd be born in Nazareth? Where does it say that? Or where, where can we go back to the Old Testament? Because it says here it would be fulfilled. How he's spoken by the prophets, he should be called a Nazarene. And of course you can't find it. It says they spoke it, not that they wrote it. They spoke it. You've got prophets, plural, speaking, and what they are speaking goes down and is cited here as taking place. But what they spoke, they didn't write, which is similar to the, the last few verses of John's Gospel. Many miracles he did, you know, if they were all written down, not enough books in the world could contain them all. And therefore, this slightly throws people because they say, well, I can't write this out. They spoke it, but they didn't write it. And that's right. Because if they wrote down everything that they spoke, or if they wrote down everything that was revealed to them, it'd be the same thing for them. I mean, the Old Testament is a pretty loaded book. If you, were, if you were to write down everything that the prophets had heard and seen, there wouldn't be enough to go around. Matthew chapter 3, please. Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. So again, Isaiah is the main source that Matthew, Mark, Luke like to fall back on. I may be wrong when I say this, but from memory, John only cites Isaiah two or three times. No more than half a dozen times. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah uh, chapter 40, look at verse 1, if you will. Come ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this is another great verse to show the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got Almighty God coming in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, going back to what we touched on this morning, how the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the question gets asked again, so is Jesus Christ eternal, or is the Word of God eternal? Now, for some people, this isn't an issue. For some people, they're not particularly interested. But for those of us which are Bible believers, we should have a view on this. I think we should be able to say to, with some some level of certainty what the scripture says about this. But again, the voice of him, John the Baptist, that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. This is Jehovah. Get ready for Jehovah's arrival. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So you've got this wonderful prophecy buried back in Isaiah chapter 40. In fact, they say Isaiah 40 is the second part of Isaiah. They want to carve this book up. They say chapters 1 to 39 is author number 1. They say 40 to 52, I think from memory, is author 2. And from 50. 3 to 66 is all for 3. So they've got three people writing Isaiah. I don't believe that. And by doing that, they weaken our faith in the Scripture, going back to how Jesus Christ is, or how he enjoys the spirit of prophecy. So John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, is preaching in the wilderness, type of the world. And again, he wants uh, you to know that the Lord is on route, and I mean the one true Lord, Jehovah God. And here Matthew picks up this very event, quotes Isaiah chapter 40, go to Isaiah chapter 40, and there you are, verse 3, the voice of him, singular, this is a person, not a nation, is crying in the wilderness, and he's saying this, prepare ye, all of you, the way of the Lord, only one Lord, not two or three, make straights in the desert, a highway for our God, and again, every valley shall be exalted, 
Verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh, Jew and Gentile, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So these verses, I'm going to suggest, are very clear when it comes to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to say one more thing again, going back to, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government should be upon his shoulder, he should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I want to say this, that as I understand it, Jesus, meaning Jehovah saves, Christ, meaning the anointed, is dealing with his arrival in time. But the word, John chapter 1, the word is with the Father, or the word is with God, of course in the context it's the Father, and the word was God, the word was in the beginning with God, and the word was God. So therefore you've got the word being eternal. Going back to Micah chapter 5. But at a time of the Lord's choosing, he enters into the human race. Luke picks us up, and Gabriel will say to Mary, call him Jesus. Matthew picks us up and says to Joseph, call him Jesus. Luke chapter 1 says he'll be the son of the highest. And at that point, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Proverbs 2, Acts chapter 13, deity becomes flesh. And Jesus Christ is revealed as the Son of God. Going back to being solely and uniquely God's only begotten Son. Now, at some stage, he is begotten. I'll give you two verses. At some stage, this day, in time, thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. Old Testament, New Testament. And the word, like I say from John, chapter 1, comes amongst the children of Israel and they see him, and I will hopefully elaborate more on that next time. Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4. The Lord is now of age. He is around 30, and from this point on, he is called Son of Man, Son of God. In fact, the term, the Word, for memory, only appears in John's Gospel. The term, Son of Man, only appears in the Gospels. Paul never calls the Lord the Son of Man. He calls him the Son of God, dealing with his physical incarnation but the word is only found once like i say john chapter one matthew chapter four look at verse one please then was jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights he was afterward and hungered and when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread but he answered and said it is written Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. So the Lord comes up against the devil. And yes, there are two natures or two parts of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like I say from Isaiah chapter 9, son of man, son of God. Or we could say this in a sense, this pictures our two natures, old nature, new nature. But of course, Jesus Christ doesn't have a sinful nature. We do. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I look at verse... Three, please. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So Jesus, Son of Man, as I understand it, Son of God, it makes no difference. They both affirm his deity, but his human nature. Is up against it. He's weak. He's been uh, fasting. He's been in fellowship with the Lord. Is being tempted by the devil. When the devil got his eyes on Adam, it was all over within five seconds. When he gets his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not able to do much with him. In fact, he couldn't do anything with him really. But the point is, he's been tempted. He's been tested. Whereas Adam would fail, Christ as the second Adam would be victorious. So therefore, you've got. From Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, verse 3, you've got Israel as a nation in the context, being told that they shouldn't be existing by food and manner, the basic necessities of the here and now, but by every word that would proceed out of the mouth of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ picks us up and he goes straight back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, says the same thing. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's pretty difficult. That's really difficult to really follow the scriptures to the letter. And yet 
we should be able to fall back on the scripture the moment we are tested, the moment we are put to the test, and yet what do we do, what do I do many times? Trust in my intellect, trust in my own strength, and I fall flat on my face. Look at verse 5 from Matthew chapter 4. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now he twists the scripture, leaves a few words out, adds a few words. It's the oldest trick in the book. 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, look at verse 16, please. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah or Mesa. So again, you've got the temptation taking place in the Old Testament. They would moan, they would complain, they would be critical. And I think if you have a critical spirit, all of the time, something is wrong. You obviously had a fellowship with the Lord. And here he's going straight back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, dealing with or citing Israel's temptation of the Lord back in the land as they were uh, going into the promised land. And here the devil is having scripture quoted at him. You can never quote scripture enough. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 8, please. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now either he can give you those things, or he can't. Either this world belongs to him, or it doesn't. 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. So I'm going to say this in close, that what you are hopefully getting from this uh, study is the writers of the New Testament leaning extensively on the Old Testament. They have to go back to the Old Testament to show the Jews that he was the Messiah. But the real theme that is coming through for me anyway is from John chapter 1, verse 1, how in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, again, without this going, without getting too monotonous, I want to say this, that the word is in the beginning of time. The word is eternal. Micah chapter 5. We can't and we won't overlook that. Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is called the everlasting father. Everlasting means without any end, with no beginning, with no end. He's called the mighty God, El Gabor. That's what they call him. And that's what the Jews would call him in Hebrew. The, the El Gabor, the everlasting one, El Shaddai. And yet... The belief, the notion that Jesus Christ as the Son, being eternal, as I understand it, clashes again with Psalm 2 and Acts chapter 13. If the Son is eternal, when was he begotten? It says, this day have I begotten thee. If the Son of God is eternal, why would you have him being begotten? He's begotten at a particular time in the world, and therefore I would suggest this and say that the Word is eternal, everlasting Father, in relation to his, his relationship with Israel, not the church. But as the, fo or with the focus on the Son of God, that has to deal with his entrance into time. Conceived in the womb of Mary, born to a virgin, is born, he shall be called Jesus, he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, picked up many times in the Pauline epistles, and that, I think, is dealing with his arrival, his incarnation, and at that point, of course, he is the Son of God, and he will always be the Son of God. But we can't and we mustn't overlook the reality that at a time of the Lord's choosing, the Word enters into the world. It says in verse 14 how the Word was made flesh, not the Son, 
although the word is a son, but the word becomes a son, how the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, there's our word, begotten, of the Father, unique from the Father, the Father gives birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else was begotten in the Old Testament from God. Nobody else has been begotten in the New Testament from God. Created, only Jesus Christ is begotten as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So I will say this and dig somewhat deeper and pray a bit more about this because it's a difficult subject to understand and uh, approach to. But as I understand it, tonight the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ is problematic based on the terms only begotten, this day have I begotten thee. But the word, second member of the triune God, second member of the Godhead is eternal. And I'll give you Daniel 9, Micah chapter 5, and therefore Jesus Christ is eternal. He's always been eternal. But when you get into the Son of God, Matthew chapter 1, he's the Son of God, the Son of the Highest. And going back to the Word uh, being made flesh, dwelling among us, so on and so forth, you have to understand that at a time of the Lord's choosing, he enters into the human race, and then, and then he, he is known as the Son of God. Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast and the borders of Zabulon and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Go to Isaiah 42. The Lord Jesus Christ will say he was the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Michael Jackson made an album and he said, I am the light of the world. And about two or three years later, he was dead. When people steal the glory from the Lord, he will give you a period of time to repent. And if you refuse to repent, he will simply remove you. Uh, remove you. doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. There are some things that the Lord will not wear. And sharing his glory with somebody else is one of those things. Isaiah 42, Isaiah 42, look at verse 6, please. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles. That, of course, is our little group this morning. To open the blind eyes, spiritually speaking, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, captivity captive, and them that sit in darkness, out of the prison house. So we know that before the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, everybody went into the ground, apart from perhaps Elijah and Enoch, who went straight to heaven. Everybody else would go into the ground because their sins hadn't yet been taken away. Their sins were covered, but nobody's sins were removed, and nobody can go into the presence of the Lord without imputation, without payment for their sins. So therefore, Isaiah 42 is obviously prophesying about the Lord Jesus Christ, a good seven, uh, 700 years before the Lord is even born. And of course, part of his ministry wasn't just to set the Jews free, physically and spiritually, but to also reach out to the Gentiles. And that's probably one of the reasons why the Jews hated the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his interest, his love for the Gentiles. Not much has changed. Some 2,000 years later, there's still animosity between Jews to Gentiles and also Gentiles to Jews. But of course, the Lord Jesus Christ will bring both groups together. Nobody else can really do that. And I've said this over the years, that if the Jews in Israel and the Muslims in the Middle East all came together and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be peace straight away. But of course, it won't happen because their father is the devil. Verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So like I say, there are several things that the Lord will wear, or that he will allow, I should say, and one of the things that he will not allow is people to piggyback on him, shall we say, to rob him of his glory. I guess the biggest robber is the Pope. He likes to be called many names, the Apostle of Apostles, Holy Father, and his names come to, or one of his names comes to 666. And yet, tell an average Catholic this, they don't want to hear it. They're in complete denial. Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse 1, please. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zabulon and the land of Nephali, and afterward did more grievously affect her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. 
So again, Christ is the light of the world. It says how he lights every man that comes into the world. It says how darkness couldn't comprehend the light. And here his ministry is now in full swing. He's going all over Israel and for a period of three and a half years, he's going to preach. And yet after three and a half years, the apostles were still needing extra light, not quite sure as to the full scope of his ministry. It says over in Luke uh, chapter 2, from memory, how Mary pondered all these things in her heart. She observed him very carefully, a bit like uh, Jacob would do when Joseph starts to give revelations as to his future roles and ministry in the world and how he's going to save the world. And of course, Joseph is a type of Jesus, first coming and also second coming. Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, look at verse 16, please. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that was sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Go to Isaiah 53. So when he came, he was a full-time doctor, if you will. He was a full-time paramedic, if you will. He was the healer of all healers. He was the great physician. It would say he didn't come to call sinners, excuse me, he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's only interested in sinners like myself. Uh, he doesn't want righteous people, people that are going to put up arguments as to why they are good, why they are so wonderful. He wants people to humble themselves. And if you humble yourself, he will exalt you. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, look at verse 3, please. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's typical of all people, saved or unsaved. And that's why it says how he would have to draw all men unto himself. We were speaking to a lady in King's Cross last night. She is a Paisleyite. And she said that Paisley was the moderator of her Calvinist church. Of course, Ian Paisley is now long dead. And I said to her, so are you a Calvinist? And she said, absolutely. And we got on, we got on to uh, Ian Paisley and Richard Bennett. And I said, well, Richard Bennett is a hyper-Calvinist. Really, she said. I said, yep. I said, in the last few years, he has become an extreme Calvinist. Really has elevated grace to a level which nobody can reach, quite simply. So much so that one of my friends had to break fellowship with him. But the point is that we went to, in fact, it wasn't just her, a guy came up to us at, before she came over, a Jehovah's Witness, and he was talking to Patrick, and he said, well, it says in John, how the Lord has to draw all men unto him. This is interesting for a, a JW to even bother to cite. I said, that's true. But it also tells you in John chapter 12 how he will draw all men unto him. Again, scripture with scripture. But these verses make the case that he was despised, rejected of men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and he absolutely was. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And of course, we are shamed, ridden. We know that we are no good. A child, when they are in trouble, not only uh, runs from its parents, but will hide its face from its parents. He was despised. That's a pretty strong word. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So in the context, this is Isaiah speaking about the Messiah, a good 700 years before he was even born. And of course, this really opens up in the Gospels. Look at verse uh, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And uh, charismatics will say, Are you a sick Christian? Do you have any ailments? They say, do you have any health issues? And if you are honest, you say, yeah, I've got a bit of this, I've got a bit of that, struggle with this, struggle with that. Oh, no, they say, you shouldn't have any ailments because according to this piece of scripture, you've been healed. Well, if you think about uh, poor old Timothy from uh, 1 Timothy and old Trophimus, you think of old Paul himself, you've got three saved men with all different ailments. And if you think of the brother of Zebedee, he was martyred. I think from memory he had his head removed, uh, courtesy of uh, Herod. Nobody sewed his head back on his neck. Nobody said, let's get together, let's heal, let's resurrect James. In fact, if you think of famous executions over the years, when Mary Stuart was killed by Elizabeth, she had a pretty awful uh, execution. Several blows were needed to 
remove the head, and that wasn't bad enough. When the head was eventually removed, it rolled several yards, several feet from her body, and according to bystanders, the mouth was still moving for two, three, four, five, six minutes. Mm. Crazy, isn't it? And she said this, she said, I will die a Catholic. I've always been a Catholic. Holy Mother Church and all of that stuff. And I think had she lived today, and if she was to see what's going on in her church today, she'd be appalled. I mean, you've got to respect the woman in that sense. I mean, she's obviously lost, but she didn't compromise. All the pressure from people like John Knox and people that were sent from Walsingham and Elizabeth to try and get Mary to recant, to repent, to announce Romanism, she wouldn't do it. But here you've got a man, the Messiah, who's going to not only uh, carry your sins, but by his stripes we are healed. So we are partly healed. And of course this comes under the atonement. We are covered, we are healed from our sins. Not always a scar of sin. Somebody once said, turn your scars into stars, which sounds very nice, a bit of a corny soundbite. But what they're probably trying to say is that once you are saved, with the mercy of God and the power of the Holy Ghost, your scars should become stars. Well, that's not always the case. Paul would say he was the chief sinner, present tense. I am the chief sinner. He would say how he persecuted the church, how he got to the church to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think Paul ever really got over that. I mean, he'd been around 30 years when he wrote uh, his epistles, and yet he's still reminiscing about the bad old days, killing people, but verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Substitutionary atonement. I love that. Go to Matthew chapter 11. And yet N.T. Wright says it's an abhorrent belief. It's a wicked doctrine. It makes him feel nauseated, nauseous. Uh, he feels sick when he hears such a statement made. And yet what does he want in place of substitutionary atonement. Does he want to trust his own works? What would the Lord say about the Pharisees? Your righteousness would have to exceed theirs. And they're pretty righteous, that crowd. Praying, fasting, in the temple every day, and yet he would say, dead men's bones, you of your father the devil. Uh, externally, very righteous. Internally, dead. Completely dead. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, look at verse 7, please. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, a more than a prophet. So first of all, he's more than just a prophet. And if you say that to a Muslim, they go hysterical. If you say it to a Jew, they just look at you as if you are insane. But he would say that he was not only more than a prophet here in verse 9, he would say that he was Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of the Temple. I am that I am, my Father hath sent me, before Abraham was, I am. This is over in John chapter 10. We stone you not because you are a man, but because you make yourself to be God. Absolutely. That's why they wanted to kill him. 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. It is written, one of the most common terms in the scripture, it is written, and time after time, it is written, it is written, it is written. Look at verse 13. For the prophets and the law prophesied until John, which means John is the conclusion of the law. Revelations, per se, like uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel are no more. 14. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, this is Elijah, which was for to come. There's two parts, of course, to John's ministry, which we won't touch on this morning. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Of course, most don't have ears to hear, or eyes to see, and are going around in a daze. Go to Malachi, please. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, the last book in the Old Testament, and for some 400 years, between Malachi to Matthew, absolute silence. And uh, to fill in the gaps some of the... Uh, Church fathers, quote-unquote, church leaders, decided to take it upon themselves to explain some of the mysteries as to how we are all here. The missing years of the Lord's life from 12 till 30. And of course, some of those writings are the Apocrypha. Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 1. 
Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Two parts to this wonderful scripture. He comes the first time, and of course they put him on a cross. He comes the second time, he puts them on a cross. Spiritually speaking, of course. But there is still going to be death at the second advent. We know there's going to be death at the second advent. Psalm 110, Revelation chapter 19. But again, messenger, my messenger, prepare the way before me, the Lord whom you seek, the Lord whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refining fire, and like fullest soap. And he shall sit as a refiner, and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You've got the second, make that the third temple that goes up. Revelation 12, that temple, as far as I can think of, and uh, I'm aware of this morning, doesn't get destroyed during the tribulation. You've got the third temple, which is going to be used, found over in Ezekiel very clearly. And it could be that what is spoken of in Revelation 12, two witnesses, 144,000, is going to be perhaps not just used during the thousand year reign, but also expanded because the measurements don't match. The measurements from Ezekiel 44, 45, 46, 47 don't match the measurements from Revelation chapter 2. There's a difference. It's probably still the same temple, but the dimensions are not the same. So therefore, the Levites, spoken of here from verse 3, are going to be working in the third temple during the Great Tribulation. But here, it's further beyond the point of the seven-year mark of the beginning of the Lord's return. This goes into the thousand-year reign of Christ. So Malachi 3, 1, 2, and 3, again, dealing with the ministry of the Messiah, but also John the Baptist, because John the Baptist has two parts to his ministry, if you will. Um, it's even been suggested by some dispensationalists that John the Baptist will be resurrected to preach before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't go for that. I will leave it with Elijah. I think it's more like that Elijah who appeared with Moses in the uh, Transfiguration is probably more, uh, more suitable, more correct when it comes to understanding types and shadows. But 11, 7 to 10... Again, the Messiah's ministry has been prophesied, and so too has John the Baptist, which really does set the Bible apart from any other holy book so-called. Matthew chapter 12, please. Matthew uh, chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And of course, council, if you know your church history, is always a wicked and diabolical term, any council, any council, I mean like any council, post the councils that the Pharisees would hold were always wicked councils, always would result in the death of many people. I think the Council of Trent is probably the most infamous. Over 100 curses put on people such as ourselves, former Catholics. But here the Pharisees are going to have a council to decide how they might destroy Jesus. Wonderful religious people. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, a prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my well-beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So he disappears from one part, one part of town when the Pressure is on, not for his own safety, of course, but for the welfare of his apostles. And as he's going from A to B, he's healing people. We would say today he's multitasking. No time is wasted, a bit like our time in London this week. We want to do as much as we can, not just have a reading in the morning, but go onto the streets, get the banner up, speak to people, do a bit of filming, return to previous projects. And here the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as my servant my anointed one. Go to Isaiah 42, please. Again, Isaiah is quoted time after time after time after time. And that's one of the reasons why, like I say, liberals and apostates and heretics will 
attack Isaiah because if they can attack it, you miss the cross-references. And if you miss the cross-references, you don't see the prophecies. And without the prophecies, this book is just another book, quite simply. If someone comes up to you and says, why should I believe the Bible? Quick answer, prophecy. You can say you know, archaeological stuff. You can say there's been this or you know, that found. You can say uh, there's material in the uh, Talmud or the Quran. But don't waste your time going down those paths. Just say Bible. Bible prophecy. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Look at verse 1, please. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Father speaking about the Son. And in the context, Gentiles are going to get a look in. And I wonder what Isaiah would have made of this when he first wrote it. Look at the problems that the Lord had with Jonah. You will preach to the Ninevites. I won't preach to the Ninevites. You will preach to the Ninevites. I won't preach to the Ninevites. He almost drowns the man. In fact, he does drown the man. The boat almost sinks. And eventually Jonah arrives in Nineveh, modern-day Iraq. He's covered with the insides of a whale a great fish his skin has probably changed color and he's going around saying repent 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 and they all repent must have been shot two he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street and every time when i do street preaching people say you shouldn't be doing this my friend it says here that the messiah wouldn't be heard in the streets and I always go to this piece of scripture but in the context it's in reference to being a rabble rouser like let's overthrow herod let's overthrow pilate Let's have a revolution. That's the sort of thing that I think is being spoken about here. Not repent, turn or burn sort of a thing. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. So you can appreciate to some extent why a good number of people question the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, because here they're reading about his human side discouraged god doesn't get discouraged and yet it says over in genesis 6 that he was grieved with the sons of men i mean it does speak many times of the lord's mercy and not just his mercy but his emotional state very emotional nothing wrong with being emotional but here messiah anointed son of man son of god god's spirit the holy ghost is put upon him he's anointed and as a result he's going to be preaching and he's going to be going to the jews of course first and foremost and with them rejecting him, he will go to um, the Gentiles, which also feeds back into what you read from the Gospel of John, how um, I have sheep that are not yet of this flock. And of course, the sheep that he was referring to would be the Gentiles. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, please. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse uh, 38, please. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And of course, they are entitled to a sign, but they don't really want a sign. I guess it's like going to Rome. You start preaching the gospel. They don't really want you there. They might say, well, you know, why are you here? We're all good Catholic people. But here, once again, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious elite, so, so-called, are wanting a sign. In some ways, they probably thought he was a street performer. Put on a show for us. 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, being Jonah, of course. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Go to Jonah. And there have been several people over the years that have been swallowed by fishes and whales, and, would you believe it, have survived. But if you listen to typical uh, scoffers, professional antagonists, they make fun of this account of a man and a fish. They say, but how could he survive? Jonah chapter 1, look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So Jesus Christ is in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, let's get a little deep. Jonas, three days, three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He dies on the cross. His body is buried. His spirit goes back to heaven. His soul goes into the ground, Abraham's bosom. And whilst it's there, it deals with the righteous dead and the unrighteous dead. His soul is offered for a sin offering. His soul is offered for a sin offering. He 
became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He becomes a sin offering for us. Now, you can't really understand that. But what some people like to suggest is this, that upon his death, he became a sinner. I don't think so, but they believe that. And they say this, that he goes into hell where he is tortured. I don't believe that. And he has to become the first born again man. I don't believe that. But something happens on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Back up to the latter part of this Gospel, Matthew. He's crying, he's falling, he's sweating blood. He says, stay with me, pray, pray with me all night. The son of man, excuse me, the uh, son of perdition is en route. He's got nothing on me but plenty on all of you lot. My, my uh, abbreviation, of course. Uh, but it's true, he had nothing on the Lord. And therefore, he starts to struggle, the struggle of the Saviour. Because for the first time in his, not just human existence, but his pre-eternal existence, he's now going to not only see sin, but become sin. Now, you can't really understand that. I think it's like the experiment that took place back in London, back in the 1940s, which Patrick might remember reading about. They gave a man a brand new white suit, a beautiful white suit, dinner suit, tuxedo sort of a thing. And back in the 1940s, the air in London was filthy, just rotten before the Clean Air Act came in. And the test was simply this, to give a man a beautiful white suit um, and he would leave his place of employment or his, his property, shall we say, 9 a.m. and go around the whole of London for 12 hours. And by 9 p.m. he went back to wherever he, was, wherever he started from and the scientists were there and the CSI people were there and they started to take his coat off and examine the, the, the dirt, the soot, took his trousers off, and to cut a long story short, he was filthy. He was filthy. That is some mild way of trying to understand the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, completely sinless, not only being in the presence of sinful people, but becoming a sin offering, going back to some extent to Joseph's multicolor coat back in the book of Genesis. But I think what, or well, the best way to try and... Uh, comprehend this is to literally take the position that Christ takes our place on the cross, goes into hell, and before he goes into the ground, he says, I thirst, repeating what the rich man would say, Father Abraham, I thirst, picturing people dying for water in hell, and he's starting to already taste the agony of what we should all taste as, before we were saved, condemned sinners. Now the Lord had prepared Jonah, a great fish, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we could say this, we could say that Jonah was in the fish, literally, and of course he was, for three days and three nights. We will say that Jesus Christ was literally in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. We will say that Jesus Christ literally did die. There's no way around it, he did die. But let's look at Jonah, 2.1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cry by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So, follow me now. A person dies pre-Christ. They go into the ground. Saved or unsaved, it doesn't make any difference. They go into the ground. They arrive in the ground, Abraham's bosom. They can see, they can speak, they can feel. They're conscious, okay? This is what we call the first death. Now, the second death is very different. Second death takes place back end of Revelation 20 from memory. And at that time, if you cross-reference that back to Mark chapter 9, your soul, if you're an unsaved person, starts to become deformed. There's a deformity. Charles Darwin said that man comes from animal. But it's been said by some that man reverts back to animal upon the second death. Because it speaks about the worm never dies. Multiple times in the Old Testament, the description of an unsaved person is of a worm. Now, of course, a worm can't see, it can't hear, it certainly can't speak, but it can move around. It can feel like a maggot. So therefore, we could suggest this, and we will, and then I'll close, that Jonah dies, he goes into the ground. Jesus Christ dies, he goes into the ground. Jesus Christ is set in captivity captive. It says over in Colossians how he uh, proclaim victory. He, he made a show of them openly. And also Peter picks up on this message. So you've got these, this communication taking place. And I think it's fair to say that Jonah goes into the fish, the great fish, dies, 
and he's speaking Abraham's bosom. Just stay with me. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. The rich man in hell is praying to Abraham and said, I cry by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice. So Jonah was a saved man. Jonah has been put into this fish for three days, three nights. He dies and he's still speaking to the Lord like the rich man does in hell. Verse three, for thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yea, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O Lord, my God. 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So, let me try and pull these verses together and make this hopefully uh, sound a bit more plausible, a bit more straightforward. Christ dies, Jonah dies. Jonah is a type of Christ. Jonah is swallowed by a fish, a great whale. He's in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. Yes, it's possible he didn't die, of course. I won't say that. I won't say that he didn't die. It is possible he survived for three days and three nights, and he's subconscious, and he's being buffeted to and fro and everything else. But when I think of the rich man, I think of Lazarus, I think of Jesus Christ dying, I think it's interesting that it is possible that he dies. This is Jonah, of course, and he's in Abraham's bosom. He's having a conversation with the Lord, going back to the rich man. And also Abraham is speaking back and forth. Abraham is a picture of God the Father, of course. And therefore the Lord says to the fish, let him out. Regurgitate him, kick him out. Resurrect him. How about that? Resurrect him. Revive him. After four days, Christ would resurrect Lazarus. And therefore Jonas is regurgitated or removed from the fish's stomach, barely call it what you will, and he comes up, his skin is changed. We could suggest this, that it's a picture of Christ's resurrected state. When he comes up, Mary doesn't recognize him. He's in his glorified state. Jonah comes up, resurrected. Let me use that term. He's changed. He preaches to the Ninevites. They get saved. Christ comes up out of the tomb. His skin is changed, a bit like Moses, when he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the mount. He preaches to the apostles. Their faith is increased. They preach to the Jews. They get saved. They preach to some of the Gentiles. They get saved. So Joan is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet this account is mocked. It's scoffed. People think it's a fairy tale, but it's not. It's a wonderful story of what God can do. Someone like Jonah, he will literally, he will literally kill Jonah, if you follow my logic, put him into the sea. And also it's a picture of Jonah's new birth via the sea. We're born again spiritually, of course, via water. And then once we are born again spiritually by, by the blood, then we're baptized physically by water. So there are many similarities between Jonah and Jesus. Both were Jews. Both were preached to Gentiles. Both would die. Both would spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And I mean in the heart of the earth. Jonah could easily have gone into Abraham's bosom because Christ, Christ obviously hadn't come at that time. And after three days and three nights, he comes up. And after three days and three nights, Christ comes up out of the ground, is then declared to the world as a resurrected Christ. And Jonah is declared, if you will, as the new man. So the plan had been to look at every prophecy in the four Gospels, and like I've been saying over the last few mornings now, it won't be possible. So what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, is call this the Prophecies of Christ, Volume 1, and the next time we all meet up, it'll be Prophecies of Christ, Volume 2, Volume 3, so on and so forth. There's just far too many to cover in four days. Matthew chapter 13, please. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 13. Therefore spake I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. And of course, nothing much has changed since the Lord spoke those words. I've lost count as to how many times I've attempted to explain the simplicity of Christ to people. It could be in Britain, it could be in Spain, it could be on the continent, it could be anywhere at any time. It could be via videos, it could be via 
the walking talking pulpit that could be via radio broadcasts and so many times people just fail to comprehend it and i'm convinced that many times they don't want to comprehend it they deliberately put up a smoke screen but here the lord is speaking about the jews because they are temporarily in blindness and where we are currently staying this is very much a jewish area a stronghold and last night we went off for our meal and we saw a group of jewish boys praying it was around 7 7 30 p.m and in half an hour or so later the windows were closed and they're rocking back and forth which is what they are accustomed to do deep in prayer and may i say it's slightly bizarre to observe but of course it's a custom it is a custom but the lord is speaking about the jews temporarily blinded because look at verse 14 and in them it's fulfilled the prophecy of isaiah being isaiah once again which saith by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Go to Isaiah chapter... 6 from memory, yes, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse 5 please. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's the right thing to say. And here Isaiah is speaking about getting a glimpse of the one true God. And of course, he knows that he is a man undone, he's unclean, which is the absolute correct thing to say. That's why you have to hold to imputation. If you don't hold to imputation, if you hold to presenting yourself in your own works, you've got no chance, no chance whatsoever. Six, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. A wonderful passage looking at imputation, which I won't speak about today. I could speak about it until the cows come home. It's a wonderful doctrine, very much underrated and neglected. Look at verse 8, please. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. So we believe we are here this week for a purpose. We believe we are here to do two or three things. By the grace of God, we've been able to have a reading every morning. And one, in the evening, we've been able to travel all over London. We've been able to uh, record some videos. But the most important part of this get-together is, of course, to get the gospel out, to get the banner up, to give out tracts, to plant seeds. And here Isaiah is desperate to move. He's desperate to go. Go, God, good news, gospel, go, do something. Be ready in season and out of season. Send me, the verse 9. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. It's almost like a paradox, isn't it? Make the hearts of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Absolutely deadly. The Jews are under the judgment of God. Now this goes back, way back to probably 1 Samuel chapter 8. It starts there. It goes back to Judges, or every man would do that which is right in his own eyes. It goes back to treachery. It goes up to people like uh, one of David's sons wanting to claim the throne, Absalom, of course. It goes back to the wickedness of Solomon having multiple wives and concubines. It goes back to the sin of idolatry, which is the greatest sin in both Testaments. And the Lord said, I'll give you a period of time, a period of grace. The prophets come, the prophets go. Some are killed. And we'll get to that probably, well, maybe next time over Matthew 23 from memory. And eventually the Lord said, that's it. I'm going to send you guys into captivity. You'll be forced to dance to the tune of the Gentiles. You will be humiliated because you are supposed to be in the driving seat, you're not the passenger, and yet the Jews are in the passenger seat today. Israel wouldn't last five minutes without Western help. As blessed as she is, as historically sacred as she is, based on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if America was to pull the rug from under the feet of Israel, they would sink. 
they'd really struggle. Yes, they were able to go back into the lane, 48, and beat the Muslims, and again, 67 and 75. The first time it was down to British help, British rifles, British expertise, going back to uh, Major General Wingate, a British Christian man from the Brethren Assembly, and it was Mickey Marcus, an American colonel who flew to Israel in the late 1940s to give them training, and by 1967, the Six-Day War, they are very much part of the American framework, the Americans set up, because the Americans were terrified that Israel would become a communist country, because the leaders from 1948 right up until perhaps Goldemir, or even before Goldemir, were socialists. They were atheists, they were communists. They'd all been to Moscow, had been trained by the Russians, but bit by bit they broke away from Russian dominance, Russian uh, interference, shall we say, and align themselves closer to the Americans. And he said, verse 9 again, Go and tell this people, Israel, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. So he's going to speak to them, he's going to preach to them. John the Baptist would do the same, and they would say, Who do you think you are? Where have you come from? Can we check your credentials? When were you ordained? Where do you get your authority from? You're this kook out in the desert, you dress somewhat in a funny sort of a way. You speak a bit rough. You're kind of uh, crude, a bit rough around the edges. Who do you think you are? And they have no time for him. They make fun of him. And the Lord turns around and says, one day, that man is the greatest man that ever lived. Pre the kingdom of heaven arriving. Because, of course, he would preach about it. Some people would go into it based on his preaching. Ten, make the hearts of this people fat and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So this is deadly. This is the Lord's judgment on Israel. Go back to Matthew chapter 13. And when the Lord arrives, it's deja vu. When Isaiah would preach the gospel, when Jeremiah would preach the gospel, when Ezekiel would preach the gospel, they had no time for those guys. Going back to the Schofield footnote, he says this, that Jews today are following Ishmael. They're Ishmaelites. An interesting statement from C.I. Schofield. And that's one of the reasons why Jews, for the most part, had no time for Jesus. Because technically speaking, although they are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they're not following Isaac. They've married the daughters of Ishmael. You've got this unholy union. And that's why they put the Lord on the cross. That's why they would reject all of the apostles. And that's why they put their kings and their leaders to such grief. Going back to the Old Testament, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. But you won't find many dispensational teachers wanting you to know that because it's not politically correct. Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, cast your eye over please, verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Go to Psalm 78, parables, riddles, truths within truths, keep them guessing, or give them so much truth, and then when it suits you, you can... Uh, further elaborate, further explain the deeper things of the Word of God. This is one of the reasons why the apostles would have daily briefings. The Lord would speak to thousands of people. He would heal thousands of people. And then turn around and say to the apostles, the actual meaning would be such and such. But it's for your ears only. It's for your eyes only. Uh, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. So we go back and forth. This book is circular, like I say. And if you get the New Testament down, you should normally get the Old Testament down, but not always. Psalm 78, Psalm 78, look at verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. The mouth of the Messiah, he would come to elevate the law, he would come to sharpen the law, but he would come to fulfill the law. Two, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. So, the Messiah is speaking, and here from Matthew 13, he is simply quoting his own statements. He quotes himself. I will open my mouth, this is the Lord speaking, in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. So of course, the Messiah is Jewish. He relates himself to the people of Israel because he's a son of Israel. His mother Mary is a daughter of Israel. Going back to what we said yesterday from Revelation chapter 12, woman, crown on her head, stars under her feet, so on and so forth. That's a double application, double prophecy. 
It's Israel, of course, as a nation. That's the first part from, uh, from Revelation chapter 12, but it's also dealing with Mary as a daughter of Israel. And as Revelation 12 continues to unfold, you've got Israel in the tribulation. Mary is long dead, and she's being protected during the time of the tribulation. She's physically, uh, Mary is physically long dead. And eventually the Lord sends people to help Israel, not Mary out. Uh, Psalm 78, 4. We have not hid them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. So I'm going to say this, that if there's one thing you cannot condemn Christ for, would be for not worshipping the Lord, not glorifying the Lord. I mean, if you don't believe on him as the Son of God or the Messiah of Israel, who in the world was he? I mean, not many people have come along as a Jewish gentleman between the ages of 30 to 33, would quote extensively from the Old Testament, really sharpen the Old Testament, and on top of that would say this, well, your fathers have said this, you people say that, but I'm going to say this, and then add to the written revelation. Only the Messiah could do that, because, of course, the Spirit of God is inside of the Messiah. Matthew 13, still in Matthew 13, uh, look at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us a parable of the tares of the field. Going back to, I will brief you guys later, but for now I'm going to give a general message to the people. If they have eyes to see, they will see. If they have ears to hear, they will hear, and they will further inquire. But now it's time to spend a bit of time with you guys, my inner circle. 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is a devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. This is a global message. And yet, if I had the, I won't say courage, but if I had the uh, tenacity perhaps to approach some of our Jewish friends in this part of London, I'd like to say to them, do you have any interest in the Gentiles? Do you love us? We love you. I mean, we're all going to die. All of us in this room today will be dead within probably, at most, 40 years. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more. No more than 50 years, I would suggest. And according to your Old Testament, I assume you guys all believe in hell. I guess some Jews do. Where are we going to go, Jewish friends? Absolute silence. And if I was on the floor dying and I had 30 seconds to live, what would you tell me? Wouldn't they look at you? They'd have no idea how to, how to answer such a question. And you were told as the Jews to to glorify Jehovah. You were told to witness to non-Jews as to the glory of Jehovah, but they don't care. They just don't care. Verse 40, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so should it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So does this concern you, my Jewish friends? Does this concern anybody I have to ask? I mean, it concerns me. We're here for a purpose. 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a son in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. There's that term again. And yet, tragically, most don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. And again, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth, and setteth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. What sacrifice would our Jewish friends make? I mean, the greatest Jew that ever lived died for the sins of the world, left heaven, came down to earth, took time with Jews and Gentiles, united two people to become one, being the body of Christ. I'm not saying all Christians are as good as they should be. Most probably aren't. But even the most backslidden Christian knows deep in his or her, his or her heart that he has to do something. And it could be before such a person leaves this world, they start opening their mouth. It could be that a backslidden Christian man or woman may find themselves in a hospital bed with maybe a few days to live and starts to get under conviction and starts opening his or her mouth to share the gospel. I'm sure some of our medical friends that are saved could probably confirm that for us. wouldn't surprise me at all. We went to Scotland this year and went into a very well-known bookshop and we spent some time speaking to an elderly co-owner and she told us how her dear brother, he must be in his 90s, has been in hospital for six months. Six, seven months. I thought it was torturous to hear that. And she said he won't, well, she didn't say this, but I thought she was alluding to the fact that he probably won't be coming out because he has nowhere, or he can't go back to his home because he's, I think, in a high-rise 
block of flats, perhaps, and he can't get up the stairs. He's had both his hips replaced. I mean, 94, come on, 95, that's pretty rough, isn't it? And for whatever reason, they can't find him a lower ground property to live in. And I thought, if that old brother's not careful, he would probably die in that hospital. But I wondered to myself at the time, I wonder if he's witnessing to that crowd. He probably is. I spoke to him several times on the phone over the years. But here, again, the kingdom of heaven, verse 45, is like unto a merchant man seeking, a goodly, seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And of course, that term, pearl of great price, was copied by Joseph Smith for the Book of Mormon, which, of course, he didn't write. He purchased from a reverence. Spalding, from memory, an apostate uh, Calvinist minister. But here, he finds this great pearl, a pearl of great price, sells all that he has and buys it. Now again, my Jewish friends, in fact, let, me just, let me just broaden this. My Muslim friends, my Masonic friends, my Catholic friends, what are you people doing? I mean, you all say you believe in God. I know Catholics can be very religious. They go to Mass if they are, or if they were like Patrick. I mean, every day of the week, what would they do once they left church? Probably nothing. What do Freemasons do once they give money to charities? Not much. I've never seen a Masonic outreach of you. I've never seen Freemasons with a trestle table up in central London saying, come be a Freemason. Not likely. I've very rarely seen Muslims promoting Islam. They do, unfortunately, do such a thing, but very rare. And I've never seen Jews, never seen Jews giving out Jewish tracts. 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So you see, once again, it's all about getting the gospel out. Go to Matthew chapter 21. It's about being busy. It's about not sitting around. It's also about doing this through love, not through uh, contempt or anger or frustration. There are Christians that will open their mouths many times because they are bitter, resentful, even jealous. That's not going to help. There's enough nonsense going on all around us without it coming from the church. Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21. Look at verse 1, if you will. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them. And bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. The Lord. El Gabor. Going back to Isaiah chapter 9. The Lord. And people say, but the Lord Jesus Christ never said he was the Lord. Yes, he did. I've got recordings. I've got quotes from ex-nuns that are now atheists. Ex-priests that are now atheists. Ex-pastors that are now atheists. They have quite a time of it, and they'll make statements up about the Lord. They'll say, he never said this, or he never said that, or this is being fabricated. He never called himself the Son of God. Yes, he did, and he just told you he is the Lord. Verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fowl of an ass. Go to Isaiah uh, 62. Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62, fowl of an ass, Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62. He gets on a donkey, not a stallion. He gets on a little tiny animal, a donkey. Uh, second advent, he comes back on a horse, a white horse. First time he comes, crown of thorns is put on his head. Second time he comes back, he's got a royal crown to wear. Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62, look at verse 11. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So again, this is for the Jews. He comes first and foremost for the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. The Jews have to be offered the chance to be redeemed. Of course they do. They are God's covenant people. And unfortunately, they would reject the plan of salvation many times, and by Acts chapter 7, they are now temporarily frozen out. From Acts chapter 7 to the rapture of the church, we are the Lord's people. It's as simple as that. You can be as Jewish as you want. You can pray five or six, seven or eight times a day. You can go to Israel. You can go to uh, Gold is Green. You can go to uh, New York. They've got many Hasidic and Orthodox Jews there. 
You can go anywhere in the world where Jews are living and they can be praying as much as they want. He doesn't hear their prayers because they crucified the Messiah. They are now cast off and they can't be saved. And this is something which people don't want to talk about. John Hagee says the Jews are saved a different way to the church. He says there's two plans of salvation. The Jews get saved one way, the church gets saved another. The Roman Catholic Church says the same in their catechism. That's not true. That's not true. Unless they repent, unless they believe that Jesus Christ is the I Am, John chapter 8, they will die in their sins. The next time you get a chance to, or if you feel confident enough to witness to our Jewish friends, just uh, put the gospel to them and see what they say. The Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, verse 11, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Israel, of course, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Jesus, of course, means, or Joshua means salvation, Jehovah saves. This is a personal saviour, not just a plan of salvation. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So again, two parts to this wonderful uh, scripture, making the case clearly and without any doubt what his purpose is going to be. It's not just to come and set a good example, as some would have you believe. It's a lot deeper than this. It is paying for your sins, paying for all of your sins. You can't save yourself. Go to uh, go to Zechariah, please. Um, Zechariah chapter nine. Zechariah chapter nine. Zechariah nine nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Zion! That's good news. Shout, raise your voice. But they won't, of course, today. They won't shout the gospel to you. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, king of, the, uh, king of the Jews, king of Israel. He's not called king of the church. This is obviously in reference to Israel. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fall of an ass or foul of an ass. So again, you've got him on a donkey of some kind, a small, low, a small indescript or nondescript animal, I should probably say. And he's not coming with this great fanfare. He's not being carried into Jerusalem like the popes would be carried. He's coming in a very lowly sort of a way, which would be missed by most people. Go back to Matthew 21, please. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Look at verse 12, please. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. I love that. My house. Now, of course, people say, well, he's just quoting the scripture. He's not saying that it's his, it's his literal house. Well, hold on. He said it was, he told us he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He told us he was Lord of the, the Lord of the temple. So why wouldn't he be saying it here? Go to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. So once again, Isaiah has been cited. Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. Look at verse 7, please. If I make it verse 6, verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Thousand year reign, of course, but for here and now we are the strangers, of course. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, second advent, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, second coming. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, but for today our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. For today we sacrifice ourselves. And if you speak to Seventh-day Adventists, they like to quote this piece of scripture and say, do you keep the Sabbath? And do you keep the Sabbath, they say. And you say, no, I don't keep the Sabbath. They say, well, you're supposed to keep it here. But the question then gets put to those people, where is the mount now? Where's the holy mount now? Don't tell me it's in New York, where Mary Baker Eddy came from. Don't kid me. Don't tell me it's in uh, London or Paris. This is for the future. But again, you've got two or three applications being played out, very much uh, taking place here. But for Matthew 21, for Matthew 21, uh, 12 and 13, Jesus is speaking about his house becoming a house of merchandise. And that goes back to what Peter would tell you from 2 Peter 2, 1, how they make merchandise of you, from you. They make money off your backs. And that's one of the reasons why Luther would launch the Reformation. He went to Rome on one occasion and he was sickened by what he saw. I mean, talk about being naive, but I guess he was, what do they say, closeted. He was obviously tucked away. He was busy praying and fasting in his monastery, a very 
pious thing to do, had little contact with the outside world. And then one day he was sent by his father superior, and that's what they call them in the monasteries. And he arrives in Rome. I mean, talk about a shock. <laughs> and he sees what's really going on in Rome. And he says, this is just an abomination. People are setting statues of Mary, statues of this, statues of that, indulgences. Go to Jeremiah chapter 7. And he says, I can't stand it. I'm just sick to the stomach. And he challenges the church of Rome. And they call him for a meeting, a informal inquisition, I suppose. And he arrives, he's ill-prepared. And they, I won't say wipe the floor with them, but he's taken by surprise of their ferocity and their tenacity and their desire to silence him. And he has a long prayer service that night with the Lord. And to cut a long story short, the following day he goes back to the good Catholic gentleman and he says something along the lines of, here I stand, I cannot go against my conscience, uh, I will not recant. And that starts the beginning of the Reformation. Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 7, look at verse 11 please. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And of course that's just what is grieving the Lord. He's gone to his house, he's gone up to the temple. I am the Lord of the Sabbath, I'm the Lord of the temple. You call me Master and Lord, and so I am. Unless you believe I am, you would die in your sins. Before Abraham was, I am. I mean, you, you can't avoid these passages, or you can't you know, fail to see these passages unless you don't want to see them. Uh, I'll give you one more, I'm going to close. Matthew 21, Matthew uh, 21, Matthew 21. Look at verse 15, please. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto him, Yea, have you not read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. I love that. And it's very true, isn't it? If you are blessed to have a saved child, go to Psalm chapter 8. I mean, a young child. They're very cute, they're very sweet, and they read the Bible and they pray with their mother and father and they do all the things they're supposed to do, and they are the apple of their parents' eye, and they sometimes read the Bible, they will sometimes do what they should do, and then they grow up, and they become secular, they become atheist. Yes, it happens even to Christian families. Psalm chapter 8, Psalm chapter 8, look at verse 2, please. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And of course, the term babes doesn't just mean children, under the age of accountability, we are called children. Jesus called us children. He would say many times, children. He would say to one woman, she's a daughter of Abraham. He'd call another man who was about 50 or so, son. So that goes back, of course, to Jesus Christ being the everlasting Father, not God the Father, but the everlasting Father, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And again, he has many terms, many uh, titles, and for here and now, we referred to him primarily as Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Israel, as God's covenant people, are going to have many titles to refer to him as and through and by during the thousand year reign of Christ. So this will be all for today. Like I say, this will be the Prophecies of Christ, Volume 1. And we've got quite a lot still to look at, but it won't be possible to do it this time around. Uh, we may try and do one more later today, if time allows. But I think from Matthew 21, verses 15, 16, really does bring it home, and I'll read it one more time from verse 16. And he said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Listen to what they're saying. And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, absolutely have I heard this. Have you never read? Bit of a put down. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. In other words, a child can spot the glory of the Lord. A, a child can spot the majesty and beauty of the Lord and receive the gospel, the grace of God and yet tragically for many people, older people don't want to see it, will not receive it and they turn down this wonderful plan of salvation, this wonderful message from Almighty God and they end up trusting their own righteousness. They actually think they have something to offer the Lord. And I'll say one final thing and I was talking to one of our group the other day and I said this that some years ago I was in Manchester and a Muslim man came over to me and we got into a conversation about Muhammad and Jesus and I said to this 
Islamic gentleman, let me be quite honest with you, I said. If what I believe is wrong, then I'm not interested in any other religion, couldn't care less. And if what you are saying is right, I don't want to be in your heaven forever. I looked quite shocked at that. And I said, let me explain myself. I don't want to be in the presence of a man called Muhammad who married a little girl when she was six and when she was nine took her virginity. I don't want to be around that kind of a person. If that's what you think heaven is all about, never mind the 72 virgins, never mind the honor killings, never mind the mutilating young Muslim women, if that's what you think a good man is, and they called him the greatest man that ever lived, Muhammad, if that's your definition of greatness or goodness, if you think that's the sort of man that we should be elevating, if that's the sort of guy that you people think uh, or you, you believe to be the greatest that has ever walked the face of this earth, count me out. I don't want to be in heaven so with that kind of a setup. So I'm going to just leave it with Jesus. I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to waste five minutes trying to be a good guy because I'm not a good guy. I'm not going to waste my time trying to better myself, trying to overcome this or overcome that. Yeah, I could probably clean up a few things in my life, obviously, but that's not going to make any difference. It's all about the blood of Christ. And this Muslim guy was shocked, shocked. And I said, uh, and you can, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I didn't say that. But I could see he was taken back by my statement about not wanting to be in an Islamic heaven. And you know what? I haven't changed my mind. I still believe the same thing today. I wouldn't waste five minutes becoming a Jew. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't live that culture. Could you live that culture? I couldn't, I wouldn't last five minutes. I couldn't learn the Hebrew. I couldn't learn the Aramaic. I couldn't conform to the dietary restrictions. I couldn't conform to the dress code. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it with the Muslims. I couldn't dress up like they dress up, go to prayers every Friday, learn Arabic. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't conform to that way of life. Now the Catholics, they got a very easy setup. Wow. I mean, that's a really easy religion to be a Catholic. And I was for a long time. But outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, outside of imputation, not interested. And that's why this is being laid out in such a simple way that even babes can get it. Sucklings can get it. They can proclaim the glory of the Lord. And that's why I say if you have a saved child, I mean a young child under 12, a young child, or let's say under 18, a young boy, a young girl, a good child who loves the Lord, loves their parents, and they, they pray with their parents. They praise the Lord with their parents. That's a great blessing and cherish that because, can I say, it may not always be that way. Okay, so what I want to do uh, as we continue to work through the prophecies of Christ is just take a slight detour, if you don't mind, and share some statistics, some worrying facts that I have discovered over the last little while, and try and tie this into the message at hand. In the UK, the Ministry of Defence is now paying for sex changes, all thanks to the very generous, quote-unquote, British taxpayer. Twins' DNA is identical. There are only three types of blood, Asian, Black, and Caucasian. No transgender blood. 41% of transgender people will go on to commit suicide, and the figure remains the same even after they receive their surgery. People should be hired on their merits, not preferred sexuality. Mike Pence, the American vice president, a professing Bible-believing Christian, swore in a practicing homosexual to become the American ambassador to Germany. That's the U.S. ambassador to Germany, and very little was said from the religious world. White males are more likely to commit suicide than black males. Transgender deaths are higher now than those that lived in death camps during World War II. A father, a mother, and a child. Three simple aspects to mankind, and we would call such basic biology. The so-called good and the great many times lead very tortured lives. Tina Turner's son would commit suicide when he was 59. Most women didn't want the vote back in the beginning of the 20th century due to not wanting the responsibilities like the draft, like didn't want to go and fight overseas. Serena Williams, the number one tennis player in the world, regrets missing her daughter's first steps due to playing at Wimbledon. And they say that a woman can have it all. I don't think so. The Kardashian sisters are and were unhappy at their brother's weight gain and wanted to hire a chef for him. And yet they had no qualms, no quarrels, no problems when it came to their stepfather's sex change. Isn't it interesting? Their brother put some weight. He's now a big boy and all of his sisters, he's got I think four sisters, 
were pulling him up to lose a bit of weight, wanting to hire a chef for Robert Kardashian, as he is known, and nobody said, just let him be. It's his uh, way of being. He was born that way, and yet their stepfather is now their stepmother. And nobody says a word. Insane times we live in. A male prisoner in the UK, a so-called trans, would go on to rape four women in a UK prison, even though he hadn't received his reassignment surgery. That's reported in the Daily Mail from the 18th of July 2018. George Michael was a tortured homosexual, tried to kill himself three times, was a multi-millionaire at the heights of his uh, time at the top, at the height of his fame, and yet, according to his lover, would go on to successfully kill himself. That was found in the Mail, July 2018. Fight for those aborted babies that cannot fight for themselves. Is there really a safe abortion? Does a baby have any rights? Or does a baby have the right to survive? We hear a lot about human rights, basic principles. People have a right to this, people have a right to that. People say, you're taking my rights away from me, and yet, how about the rights of the unborn baby? The most basic right is, of course, life. So why, therefore, should the baby be deprived? Why deprive the unborn of their lives if they really do believe in human rights? The child should not suffer for the father's crimes, yet the child is killed for the father's crimes. In other words, a child should not die due to their or its parents' indiscretions, and yet many times a child will die for their parents' indiscretions. In America, three out of four black girls will be sexually assaulted under the age of 18. No doubt that comes from the working class community, not the middle class community, of course. Lois Lane, who was in the Superman movies, would commit suicide some four or five months ago. And I say all of this because many times people like to speak about how wonderful it must be to be a VIP, a celebrity, and yet if you really drill in deeper into their way of life, it's not all that it's cracked up to be. PC culture, that of course is political correctness culture, is like being in a cult. Everyone is forced to blindly follow the self-appointed leader. A lot of truth in that. Radical minorities are forcing the silent majorities to submit. That is very true. A radical, tiny minority, LGBT for example, or uh, Darwinist evolutionists or evolution Darwinists, are forcing the majority, and the, and the majority are theist, not atheist, to dance to their own tune. If you are a homosexual or black man or woman, uh, you receive special treatment. In Britain we call that uh, positive discrimination. In America it's called affirmative action. Affirmative action, positive discrimination, these wonderful sound bites. It's now down to the blacks, the homosexuals, the LGBT community. They're really calling the shots. And finally, back in 1998, an awful bomb went off in Northern Ireland. Around 29 people were murdered from memory. One of the victims was a woman who was pregnant. And when that uh, story broke around the world and subsequent uh, inquiries were made, nobody was ever prosecuted for that, can you believe? But the coroner decided to include the unborn baby with the dead. Didn't say the mother and the fetus. He would say the mother and the unborn baby. So just some depressing statistics to get down for this message. And I want to try and do this from now on and make these messages not only scripturally correct, but uh, currently and right up to date. Matthew 21, look at verse 42, please. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Keep your hand there and go to Psalm 118. Marvellous in our eyes, like Father, Son, and Spirit. And by now, if you've been listening over the past hour and a half, coming up to nearly two hours, you know that there are many prophecies. And when the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, sometimes it'll be verbatim, other times it will not be. Psalm 118, Matthew is quoting Psalm 118. Look at verse 20. This gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. So a slightly different set of words, some added, some 
omitted, but it's still the same quote from Psalm 118. And many times, like the vast majority of times, when you read through the Psalms and the Old Testament in general, you've got at least two applications. First coming, second coming. Again, the prophets, when they wrote the Old Testament, didn't see the church age. This is where the charismatics get all messed up in the book of Acts. And they go to Acts 2, repent to be baptized for the mission of sins, so on and so forth, or be baptized, or repent in the name of Jesus Christ. That's not what we believe. You were told from Matthew 28 to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 is for Israel. Repent, be baptized, believe. In other words, as a nation, as a people, be identified, be identified with the crucified Messiah. So when the Apostle Paul arrived, uh, he was shown very clearly and unequivocally how the church age, the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness, two mysteries that were, were, that were revealed to him, uh, he was shown what was to take place. Go to Psalm 110, and yet most Christians, unfortunately, don't see this and don't want to see it. Uh, Psalm 110, in fact, I'll come back to Psalm 110 in a minute. Go back to Matthew 21, please. Matthew 21, did you never read in the scriptures, 42, Old Testament? Never once does he correct the Old Testament. Never once would he say an unfortunate translation. It should be A, B, and C, or X, Y, and Z. He would say the scripture cannot be broken. Jesus Christ was a biblicist. He was a fundamentalist. The stone which the builders rejected in the context, Israel from both testaments, the same Jesus Christ is become the head of the corner, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Later on he would say how it was wonderful how such truths have been hidden from the wise and prudent and only revealed to the babes. And if you are a saved sinner, you are a babe. Look at 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So a switch from Israel to the church. For today the church has replaced Israel as the people of God. This is the church age, going back to the first of all mystery of godliness, how God became a man in Jesus Christ and dwelt among us, how the church is not only now spiritual Israel, but is mystery Israel. A lot of Christians don't always appreciate this. As of right now, the church, the body of Christ, is God's representative people on the face of the earth. 44, and whosoever shall fall in the stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So, it's been said before that the Lord will give mankind enough rope to save himself, like if he was about to drown, and also enough rope to hang himself. Much truth in that. You can miss the Lord Jesus Christ by a fraction, an absolute fraction, a minute fraction. And at the same time, if you receive him or if you turn to him, you can and will be forgiven. 45, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. They weren't stupid, but they were spiritually dead. They were blinded. Paul will tell you from 2 Corinthians 4, 4, how the devil has blinded the eyes, the minds, the hearts of Israel. And that's why if you get a Jew saved, you are incredibly blessed, because the Jews are very difficult to win to the Lord. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Absolutely, but he's far more than a prophet. Matthew 22, uh, Matthew 22, look at verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. And of course, they are correct. But going back to John 8, when they were arguing about where would the prophet come from, and one Character said, uh, but nobody comes out of Galilee. And of course, they completely overlooked Jonah, for example, who came out of Galilee. They said unto him, they would say unto him, the son of David. Absolutely. He saith unto them, verse 43, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is beautiful. You've got King David on earth, living in time. Referring to a conversation, it could be in time, it could be before time. Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And now, please go back to Psalm 110. All these verses point to each other. 
Uh, I've already made the case how Isaiah is the most quoted book in the Old Testament. Psalm 110, look at verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Word for word. Many times it's not because the Spirit of God who wrote both Testaments has liberty to change what he writes. I've written many articles over the years, as has Patrick, and as the author of my articles and as the author of his articles, we both have the right to change our material, to change our writings, to change what we produce because we are the authors of our publications. And therefore, when the Spirit of God who inspired the New Testament worked through the uh, New Testament writers, when he worked through those holy men of God, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, uh, no prophecy came of old time, so on and so forth, when he worked through those people, they had the right, the liberty, thanks to the discretion of the Holy Ghost, to change certain aspects of the Old Testament, and yet it still is the same. Verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast to do of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And only Jesus Christ, incidentally, comes from the line of the order of Melchizedek. Never mind what the Mormons say. There's only one successor to Melchizedek, and that, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Five, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Second advent, he shall judge among the heathen, new earth. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies, end of the, end of the uh, tribulation, and shall wound the heads over many countries. End of the tribulation, going into the thousand year reign, and even at the end of the thousand year reign, you've got Gog and Magog, you've got the great white throne judgment, you've got the devil gathering the nations to march. And over in Ezekiel, I think it says, it will take six months to bury the dead. Seven, he shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. Go back to the Gospel of Matthew. So again, all these quotes, these citations, these wonderful prophecies are pointing back and forth to show you very clearly what is about to take place. In fact, go to Luke chapter 20, the parallel passage. We refer to this as the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and these three complement uh, each other very nicely. Only John's Gospel is around 80% unique. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. And yet Matthew's Gospel has the most in it when it comes to prophecies. Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Look at verse 46. Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. That is added on to the account from Matthew uh, 22, 41 to 46. And therefore, if you see people today dressed a particular way, they could be a friar, a Franciscan, a Dominican, or if you check out the charismatic church, white suits, tailor-made clothing, Crocodile shoes, I mean, they dress like pimps many times, pop stars, celebrities, and their followers fall at their feet. Go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 23, please. Matthew chapter 23, and look at verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias whom you slew between the temple and the altar keep your hand there and go to Luke 11 the parallel passage chapter 11 Luke uh, chapter 11 look at verse 49 therefore also said the wisdom of God I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So you can't miss it. Prophets, verse 49, like Old Testament. Apostles, verse 49, like New Testament. 
And therefore the Lord says this, everyone that was killed back in the Old Testament and those that will be killed during the New Testament going into the beginning of the second century, I will deal with like 70, uh, 70 AD, the destruction of the temple. Yes, the Lord is long suffering, uh, very patient, not willing that any should perish and hopes that all will come to repentance. But at the same time, he knows that most will not. Go to Second Chronicles. Now, this passage is one of those difficult passages to clearly reconcile with the Old Testament. Uh, different scholars have got different theories about this. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Go to 24, please. Second uh, Chronicles 24. Second Chronicles uh, 24. Look at verse uh, 20, please. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoda, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. So Zechariah, verse 20, is cited. And as always, you've got a faithful Jew standing against unfaithful Jews. And according to the commandment, the, com the uh, commandment of the king from verse 21, this uh, godly gentleman, Zechariah, found over in Matthew 23 and also Luke 11, will pay with his own life. Matthew chapter 26, please. Matthew chapter uh, 26. Matthew 26, look at 24, please. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Written of him, prophesied of him, the Lord's foreknowledge, the good pleasure of the Lord. And yet the writer, and here it of course is Matthew, the son of Levi, a Levite from a Levite family, goes on to say, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is portrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born again. That is really damning. That is really damning. In other words, the Scripture is making the case how, although this was foretold, prophesied, and of course it certainly was, I think it's from uh, the book of Hebrews, it says, Thou hast provided me a body, and also from uh, the Gospel of John, I have power to lay my life and take it again, and elsewhere it says how his time had not yet come. These are mysteries, because you've got two things going on there. You've got the sovereignty of the Lord, the foreknowledge of the Lord, written down in time, and then You've got a guy coming along in time called Judas Iscariot, and we spent some time looking at Judas during our trip to Scotland early this year. And when he gets a chance to sell out to the Lord, he doesn't think twice about it. But when it says here, Son of man goeth as it is written of him, there's no specific cross-reference apart from Isaiah 53. So turn there, please. Isaiah 53. But woe unto that man, Look out for that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good, better for that man if he had not been born, never been born. And Judas Iscariot sells him out, goes to his place, and of course that place is in the ground. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, look at 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Go back to... Matthew 26. So that is what we call substitutionary atonement, something which N.T. Wright doesn't think much of. In fact, I'm going to suggest this, that most of Christendom thinks very little of substitutionary atonement. Yesterday, when we did a bit of uh, sightseeing, a bit of uh, looking around before we did some outreach, we came across a particular building, and an old building, many years old, and inside it said, the rector is a doctor, professor, Charlotte, such and such a female vicar of the cloth and I just thought to myself I do wonder what she's been taught excuse me a canon I thought to myself what has she been taught at seminary 
I wonder. In fact, I think I know what she has been taught. Matthew 26, Matthew 26, look at verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Keep your hand there. In fact, verse 32 quickly. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So once again, he's telling you what he's going to do. He's telling you where he's going to go. You were told he'd be born in Bethlehem. You were told he'd be put on a cross, Psalm 22. You were told he would die for all of our sins, not his own. And you were told that after three days, he'll be raised from the dead. Go to Zechariah, please. Zechariah chapter 13. It wouldn't surprise me if that Professor Dr. Cannon, Charlotte, such and such, was probably taught at seminary that Paul was a woman. Wouldn't surprise me at all. And she's probably taught how the apostles were all homosexuals. And she's probably taught how Paul uh, had mental problems, emotional problems. And it's, it's kind of uh, sad, really, because when these, when these uh, people go to their seminaries and get their so-called education, their certificates... Uh, they come out as almost atheists, and yet I've never heard of a Muslim going to an Islamic seminary, have you? And having his or her faith shaken. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of a Muslim seminary or so-called Quranic school. That's how you pronounce it, a Quranic school. Coming out as an atheist. They don't, sh they don't shake their faith, do they? They'll shake your faith if you go to an Anglican uh, seminary, but they won't shake the faith of a Muslim. Zechariah 13, Zechariah 13, look at 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Another wonderful prophecy dealing with the first coming. Look at verse 8 concerning the second coming. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Concerning Israel, of course. So, You've got Zechariah 13 telling you about the shepherd being the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And here it says, smite the shepherd and the sheep in the context Israel shall be scattered. And they all ran for the hills apart from John and a few of the women. Go back to Matthew, please. Matthew 26. So like I say, Matthew's gospel written by Matthew, a Levite a tax collector by trade, a very hated man, a despised man. He got himself saved. He saw the miracles that the Lord had been doing. He heard the wonderful words of the Lord, and it turned his life upside down, and by the grace of God, he was saved. He was saved from a life of decadence, and he became one of the great men in the early church and the author of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 26, Matthew 26, look at verse uh, 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Peter, of course. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Upholding capital punishments as well, which most churches don't. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? What's that, 42,000? It's at least 30,000 from memory. 72,000. Excuse me, 72,000, thank you. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Once again, Scriptures, the Old Testament, the Scriptures have to be fulfilled. Again, the Bible is like a play, like Hamlet, perhaps, or Shakespeare, or any of the greats. You have the first half, the second half. Or you have Act 1, Act 2. I think there are at least two acts in Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. Perhaps three acts from memory. Mm -hmm. Or if you think of a football match, first half, second half. For the first half, we would say it's the Old Testament. You have that gap at the end of the first half where the players rest. Mm -hmm. We would suggest that's the uh, period of silence between Malachi to Matthew. And then the second and final half, we would say, is the New Testament. That's just my own private uh, Thoughts when it comes to trying to explain this. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In other words, I have to die, my dear friends, my dear family, so don't try and stop happening what is about to happen. 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. 
So no matter what happens, Romans 8.28 tells you how everything is always working together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And yet the apostles, time after time, were on the wrong side of the Lord and almost on the wrong side of history if it hadn't been for the Lord's mercy and patience. Matthew 27, Matthew 27, look at verse 1, please. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. In other words, we don't care about you, Judas. We've got what we want from you. And yet Judas got one thing right, innocent blood. Unlike your blood, unlike mine. Verse 5, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Picturing some of the famous people I've told you about this morning, like Lois Lane, like George Michael, like the son of Tina Turner. Six, and the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is a price of blood, so pious. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. We call that blood money, in essence, blood money. Then, verse 9, was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, the prophet, Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. So once again, another controversial piece of scripture, because it says that Jeremiah the prophet spoke, didn't write, he spoke this. And apostates like to go here and say, look, contradiction. The citation is from Zechariah. Go back to Zechariah. Zechariah wrote it. Jeremiah spoke it. So Zechariah wrote it. Jeremiah spoke it. Zechariah chapter 11, please. Zechariah chapter 11. Look at verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Did you get that? My price. Jesus is speaking here through Jeremiah. Jeremiah is on earth. He sees what is about to take place. It says elsewhere how God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And now you've got Jesus speaking through Jeremiah. Well, if you go back to John 11, on one occasion it speaks about Caiaphas giving a prophecy. And it goes on to say, the prophecy that he gave, he gave not because he was aware of it, but because he was the high priest. In other words, the Spirit of God spoke through him. And in that part of Scripture, it is in reference to an unsaved man. 13, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of all of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Judas Iscariot. You got Judas, you got Jesus, you got a two way conversation taking place from the 11th chapter of Zechariah, and yet most scholars have missed it. Go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, and I'll close. Matthew 27, Matthew 27, look at 32. And they came out and found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots." Psalm 69, please. Psalm 69. Psalm 69. You won't beat the Bible, my friend, if you're not saved. You may think that your religion is something special. Most religious people have been born into such a system. It's all they ever knew. I wasn't a Bible reader until 16 years ago. And when I read this book for the first time, it really shook me. Psalm 69. Psalm 69, look at 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, David is speaking, but of course in type, Jesus is speaking. Psalm 22, Psalm 22, 
Look at 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So that will be the end of volume one, looking at the prophecies of Christ. And by the grace of God, we've looked at around 20 prophecies. Matthew has the most. And like I say, uh, as we progress through this series, and it will take as long as it takes, we will look at other parts of the Old Testament, how they relate to the New Testament, how the writers of the New Testament quote the Old and when they quote the old, sometimes they will add words, sometimes they will omit words. But never once does that concern us, because like I say, the author of the Old Testament is the same as the author of the New Testament. Or if you record an album, you have the right to edit it as you want. If you make a movie, you have the right to re-edit it. Or if you paint a painting, you have the right to repaint it. It makes no difference, because you are the author, and at the end of the day, the author can do whatever he chooses to do and by the grace of God we have the Old Testament the New Testament and they both tell us about the man Jesus Christ his ministry and his purpose for coming to die for the sins of the world and the reason why these two books Old Testament New Testament have been given and preserved for us is really to increase our faith the Spirit of God lives inside of us we don't need the Bible we know that we are saved we know right from wrong because Almighty God lives inside of us. Over in Romans 8, it says how the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Elsewhere, John would tell you that you don't need to be taught again. You have an unction. You have an anointing. You know all things. Back in the Old Testament, David made the case that he knew more than all of his teachers combined. And that's true of anybody who was really saved. So the Bible, yes, it strengthens our faith. It's also a great tool to witness to unsaved people, to show them what we already know, because God Almighty lives inside of us. And the same Spirit that lives in us, lived in the Old Testament prophets who wrote the Old Testament, and lives in the New Testament writers who wrote the New Testament. 